Hello and welcome to Japanimation Station, an anime podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I'm Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here once again to dive into the wild and wacky world of anime this week on the show. It is episode two of season three of Japanimation Station, where we are looking at the classic adventures of Lupin the Third. And this week we are jumping up to uh, 1978 for the first theatrical film of Lupin the Third, the movie known as Lupin the Third, also known as Lupin the Third versus the Clone, also known as Lupin the Third, The Secret of Mamo, or as uh, its current modern English release in the, the title we'll refer to it as, Lupin the Third, The Mystery of Mamo. Indeed, we will go over all the titles in a bit here because it is an interesting history with this movie. Uh, but yeah, we are jumping ahead to 1978. Last week we talked about the first TV series, part one, from 71 to 72. Uh, we're jumping uh, slightly ahead in the timeline here because the second anime series, now known as part two, starts in 1977. This movie comes out a year into that run. But we are jumping to this one first because while this was made during part two... I think it is better understood, and this isn't just me, I think a lot of people would argue this, it is the part one movie, it is the yes. movie version of particularly the early episodes of part one, the staff is entirely people who did part one, um, not the like absolute top level, not Osumi, Takahata, Miyazaki, but everybody else is here, and uh, they came to play, because this movie is fucking nuts. Yeah, this, I having watched the movie, I now 100% understand uh, what you're saying here, because yes, it absolutely is, while Osumi himself wasn't involved in the movie, it is a movie version of that era, the Osumi era of Lupin the Third Part One, and as someone who for whom that was my favorite part of that show, this movie fucking rules. This is a great movie, it is weird as fuck, it is fucking crazy, <laughs> but it is fantastic. Um, it is so much better than I expected going in. Like I'll say, I have, I have yet to see Castle of Cagliostro, but that movie, in my opinion, has its work cut out for it. If it wants to be the best Lupin movie, this is a pretty high fucking bar to clear, in my humble opinion, because Mystery of Mamo, it's nuts, but it's fucking awesome. Well, yes, and, and it is, you know, these two movies have kind of been put in contention to some degree. Obviously, Cagliostro is the more famous one because Mystery of Mamo did not launch the film career of the most successful Japanese anime director of all time, uh, and Cagliostro did, so it has had a different kind of outsized reputation. But yes, Cagliostro is kind of like the ultimate film expression of the Miyazaki approach to Lupin the Third, which is the more sort of gallant, gentleman, thief, family-friendly approach that we will talk about when we get to that film in a, in a couple weeks. Uh, and this is like the ultimate film expression of kind of the monkey punch ethos, the early part one ethos, the Mad Magazine version of Lupin the Third, we might call it, because this movie is Mad Magazine as fuck. Yes. Uh, 
And, you know, I just love that we have both of them. You have not seen Cagliostro yet, so I am excited to get to that discussion because I think in these, we are spending basically three weeks in the part two era. We're doing the TV show next week and we're doing the Cagliostro film and Miyazaki's episodes of part two the week after that. And I think we will get a sampling of a lot of different flavors of Lupin here. And that is, again, as we talked about last week, that is part of the fun of this franchise. But yeah, if you dig the manga, if you dig kind of that early, again, more adult themed, but adult in a very silly way, part yes. one stuff, that is the mystery of Mamo done with a ungodly large budget and just amazing visuals and creativity. Um, and as, I, as Sean, I told you last week, sometimes... Lupin the Third just loses its mind and does crazy shit, and I told you this is an example of that. Was I correct? Yes, although, <laughs> you know, as crazy as this movie gets, it is still more plausible than the time travel one. Yes. It's not plausible, <laughs> but it is more plausible than the time travel one. Like, I think for me, because I was a little bit worried going into the movie after you said that, um, but I think what this really is fundamentally is it is if you took episode two, the magician episode, and you dialed it not to 11, but to like 111. That's what this movie is <laughs> like. It's that just scaled up to a ridiculous degree. But if you're able to accept the kind of like loosely sci fi kind of very, I don't know, like like pulp novelish kind of pseudoscience stuff that James Bond two, if he magician. was on speed is I think what yes. I would think of this movie as it's yeah yeah <laughs> like if you can accept that kind of like pulp novel sci-fi pseudoscience stuff um that's basically what this is so it's not time travel it's not like so far out there it deals with cloning and shit like that um but it just does it in a way that's incredibly goofy and ridiculous so I think it it fits within the world like the setting in the world of Lupin more comfortably for me than here's a dude who can travel through time. So it is ridiculous, <laughs> but it is, but it doesn't break the setting to me necessarily, which is good. Yeah, no. And I, I, you know, the setting is very broad, but no, this movie is an absolute delight. And, you know, I think it has long been like, I think this movie is an absolute classic in like Lupin fan circles. I don't think it has broken out and I don't think it really could in the same way yeah. like anybody could watch Cagliostro. You know, I think and a lot of people have and that is the only Lupin thing they've seen and you don't need to see anything else for Cagliostro. I do think like Mama would be, I don't know if this would be the first thing I would show someone if I was trying to yeah. onboard them to Lupin the third. Uh, but you know, as a fan, this movie gets better every time I see it. It definitely threw me for a loop the first time where I think I came too early to it. And I think I had a slightly similar reaction to you on the time travel episode of just it kind of lost me at a point. Uh, now I love it. I think it's great. It ends with an homage to 2001 and a giant brain floating out in space. Uh, and then it, it, I just I love this movie. It's so good. It has the most ridiculous match cut I have ever seen in the history of a movie and we'll I don't even want to talk about it yet because we'll got to talk about it when we talk about that part of the movie but it's just yeah this movie is fucking genius it's it's insane it's completely yes. insane but in the best ways possible all right so do you want to get into the uh, little history section as we always do here yeah so how did how did this delightful madness come to be Jonathan well, let's start just with the title because you referenced it earlier and I think we should just clarify the terms before we go ahead. Mm -hmm. So in this film's original release, and you can still see this because they haven't altered it in the movie. So on screen, it still says this. It's just Lupin the Third. It's Lupin Sansei. That is the title of the movie. That is how a lot of first films in long-running anime franchises do it. The first Dragon Ball Z movie, which we know as Dead Zone in Japan, is just called Dragon Ball Z. And that makes it extraordinarily confusing to go try to find on the internet, um, particularly the Japanese internet. But it is just called that. Same with this. It was Lupin the Third. In Japan, after the release of Cagliostro, once there were more films, they started calling it Lupin versus the Clone. And that is kind of the uh, added title onto it to like refer to this first film. Then in terms of... English titles for it, its first dub, and that is another interesting thing to talk about with this movie, is it has full four, four full different English dubs, that all of which are on the Discotheque Blu-ray release, which is a yes. pretty crazy thing to have. Like, that is, 
I think one of the best Blu-rays for an anime I think I've ever seen in terms of the completeness of the audio options. Yeah, because um, before we even get... Yeah, because we I do just want to, like, throw that out there right at the top here. If people have not watched the movie, uh, buy that fucking Blu-ray. Because this I, I, this... I did not buy a Blu-ray for every single thing that we're watching for this season, but I did grab a few. And I'm very glad that this is one of the ones I grabbed because yeah. this movie, one, it looks amazing. And it's, like, it's worth having in that really high quality. But it also is just a really great Blu-ray release that, yes, has... A stupid number of dubs and it is very fun to just flip through scenes and, and look at it in all the different versions and stuff but yes yeah. yeah no that movie has that that i've never i don't think there's any other movie i've seen this for that discotheque disc has nine audio tracks it has yeah. four english dubs one of which is in stereo and surround so that gets you to five You've got the original theatrical mono for the Japanese. You've got the 2019. This movie got a big 4K re-release in Japan in theaters in 2019. And they did a remix in 5.1 surround and in stereo. You've got both of those. And you've got an isolated score track in mono. Uh, so you have nine of those. It's just, just absolute buck wild. And I know the an earliest dub, the 1979 Toho dub, which was done in Japan for Japanese and Asian Pacific flights, they had to like... At the folks at Discotech had to reconstruct that from tapes and from partial versions, and it did it did not really exist in complete form. We don't even know who all the voices are in it. It doesn't have credits. Mm -hmm. So like that is uh, heroic work over by the good folks at Discotech. But yes, so in its first dub, that Toho dub I mentioned, which this was this was pretty common back in the day. Um, in fact, about the Miyazaki connection, people will probably know Porco Rosso, his film, was actually funded by Japanese airlines so that mm -hmm. it could play on flights. And that's why that movie opens with like 11 languages going across the screen, if you've seen that. So this was the same idea. They dubbed it in 1979 for flights. That version uh, is actually very faithful in its script. It's kind of fun to go back to. It's just called Lupin the Third. The original opening for that version just says Lupin 123 on it, and that is the title of the movie. The title, The Mystery of Mamo, that we use today is actually purely an invention of the fans. A tape of that Toho dub, which was created by TMS, the studio, to gauge interest in anime in the American market, got wound up getting kind of bootlegged and traded around U.S. fan circles, and fans started calling it The Mystery of Mamo because it needed a title. Um, then when the first kind of official outside of Japan dub started happening, the first one was Streamline Pictures in 1995, TMS suggested to them the name The Secret of Mamo, which was inspired by the fan nickname, but they kind of tweaked it, and Streamline went, eh, we'll stick with Mystery of Mamo, because that's what everyone knows it as at this point, and it's got alliteration. Then Manga UK, they dubbed it in 1996, and Pioneer dubbed it in 2003. They both used The Secret of Mamo, and then Discotech, uh, which licenses the film now, just always calls it The Mystery of Mamo for their releases of the film. That is how this movie has... A lot of titles. Yes, it, it is. And I will say, I think Mystery of Mamo is the best one, at least for English. Yes. Um, because one of the reasoning for why you want to keep the Mystery of Mamo and not go with Lupin the Third versus the Clone is because, as th this is in the liner notes of the Blu-ray as well, uh, the fact that there are clones in the movie is a pretty big plot twist about halfway through the film. It's, <laughs> it's not a thing that you want to just sort of announce in the title. Um, and, and yes, if you do Google around in Japanese about it, uh, it is a thing that Japanese Lupin uh, fans make fun of as well, is how fucking insane it is that, that this movie is called Lupin vs. the Clone, um, when th there's nothing talked about clones for almost the whole movie. I do, I also think it's weird because if I hear a movie called Lupin vs. the Clone, I think Lupin is fighting a clone Lupin, and he'll fight like another version uh -huh. of himself. Uh, and that's not what this movie is. So it, yeah, it's it's a bad title in several ways. The mystery of Mamo. It alliterates. It's good. So into the film itself. Like I said, this movie was made during the run of part two. It's really more of a part one film due to a couple things. One is the staff who makes it. We'll talk about them in a second. And this was very explicitly intended for an adult audience, uh, matching those early part one episodes. Um, they kind of figured that part two had the family audience covered over on TV. And so you could do something more adult in theaters and kind of have the best of both worlds. In reality, um, the film did do very well at the box office. It grossed nearly a billion yen. Um, and the film, but the audience leaned very heavily towards the kids who were watching it on TV for like obvious reasons. If you have uh -huh. Lupin the Third on, t and again, the show at the time was not called Lupin Part Two. It's just called Lupin the Third. I think of a movie in theaters also just called Lupin the Third. The same people will go watch it. 
And so there was some consternation among the kiddos who maybe went to see something very different than what they were watching on TV. So TMS did greenlight a sequel pretty much right away, but they did decide it should have a more family-friendly tone, which led to eventually the movie that became The Castle of Cagliostro that came out one year later. Um, but the film like very much boasted that this was kind of related to part one, attempting to satisfy those fans. That show did have a pretty rabid following already. I mean, you mentioned this earlier, Sean, that some of the reruns of part one had like record high ratings for Japanese yeah. anime. So that show, not necessarily the biggest hit in the world when it aired, but it definitely gained a following over time. And so like, if you look at the program that came alongside this film in theaters, which Discotech has reproduced on the Blu-ray, a very cool extra feature, they even brag about all the people from that show who came to work on this. So who were those people? This one is directed by Soji Yoshikawa. He storyboarded the first and last episodes of part one. This film wound up being his last involvement with Lupin, but he went on to work on lots of interesting stuff um, after, including some of Tomino's shows, like um, I think Daitarn 3 is one of them, stuff like that. Uh, he did work on some other Miyazaki projects. He's a writer on Armored Trooper Vodums, the Sunrise show. And his last, he's basically retired now, but his last big directorial project was the show Kirby Right Back At You, which you might remember from Kids WB back in the day. I think in Japan that's just called Hoshi no Kabi, which is what Kirby is always called. It's Kirby of the mm-hmm. Stars. Um, that show actually, if you look at it, had a very storied crew behind it. One of the other leads was Yoichi Kotabe from the old Toei days. It's crazy. Um, so someday we'll have to do our, our Kirby Right Back At You podcast. Yeah, well, it'll be it's not as a Japan Animation Station episode. That'll be its own dedicated podcast series yes. where we just go episode by episode through Kirby right back at you. Um, <laughs> that's that's it. That's in the pre-production phase of that podcast. Yes. Uh, Yasuo Otsuka, who we talked about a lot last week, is the chief director on this movie, um, which is kind of a it's kind of weird. You have director and chief director. Chief director is sort of like the person supervising the staff and the production. Um, but like I think in fan circles, this and like I think academia too, this is kind of considered also Yasuo Otsuka's movie. This is about as close as he ever comes to directing a project himself. And it's clearly one of the ones he had the greatest influence over over in his career. I think you can see that in the just next level attention to detail on cars Mm. and guns and everything in this movie, which even if you've seen part one, I think this movie takes it up to another level. In the program, Otsuka is quoted as saying, cars? There are no such things as cars in this world. What actually exists is a substance with a concrete shape and characteristics, such as the Porsche 125 or the Alfa Romeo. That is the most Yasuo Otsuka quote ever, uh, because that is his work philosophy. (laughs) Yeah, that feels like either he's going to say that, or I forget his name, but the guy who makes Gran Turismo. Like, it's like, you got to be that level of car nut to just be like, no, there's no such thing as cars. Like, that's not a thing. What we've got is like, here's this Porsche 125, and here's this, like, you know, it's like, there's not just a general category of cars. It's like, there's these specific things, and that's what we're talking about. What's a car? I don't know, but I know what a fucking Porsche is. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so the script was written by Soji Yoshikawa, the director. Uh, he did the first draft, and then subsequent drafts were done by Atsushi Yamatoya. Yamatoya has a lot of involvement with Lupin. He wrote episode two and seven of part one. Episode two is the magician episode with Pi Call, which you already mentioned, Sean, so there's a clear link there. Mm-hmm. Episode seven is the second Goemon episode, the one that's a little bit like Enter the Dragon. Um, he also wrote some episodes for part two, and he will co write the script for the third Lupin film, Legend of Gold of Babylon, which we will also be talking about when we get to part three. Uh, Yamatoya is a really interesting figure because he was very much a Japanese new wave figure. Um, he's involved in a lot of those films in the 60s. He works at Nikatsu. He forms a screenwriting group with Seijun Suzuki. He wrote Seijun Suzuki's most infamous film, Branded to Kill, in 1967, the movie that gets Suzuki tossed out of the industry mm-hmm. and blacklisted, basically. And then after that, Yamatoya went on to write and direct a lot of what are known as pink films, uh, including a movie called Inflatable Sex Doll of the Wastelands. Pink films, which are sort of like, they're not quite to the level of softcore pornography, but they are like movies with 
the appeal is partially having kind of nudity, eroticism. Sometimes it's a lighter load of that. Sometimes it's a lot heavier. Um, but these become big in Japan when the Japanese studio system basically starts to collapse in the late 60s and 70s and theaters kind of don't have product. And so these are pumped out very quickly. Nikatsu, which was the oldest film studio in Japan, actually transitioned entirely into pink films in that period. So that is very much where Yamatoyo's head is at when he comes to work on Lupin. And I think it shows, and it's part of the fun of this movie, is this is not imitation, like 60s new mm -hmm. wave stuff. This is uh, from the tap, you might say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it is very authentic. Yep. The director of layout and design is Tsutomu Shibayama, who worked on the pilot film. He was the character designer on that pilot film. And your animation directors here are Yoshio Kabashima and Yuzo Aoki. Now, Aoki is the key animator from part one we talked about last week, who was only 19 when they made that show. And he did the car animations in that first episode, Is Lupin Burning? Uh, Aoki would go on to do storyboards and key animation for various part two episodes. Then he became the character designer and chief director on part three where he also did storyboards and directed several episodes. And then he his kind of highest level on Lupin is he is the character designer and animation director on Legend of Gold of Babylon, the third uh, film. And this film, Mystery of Mamo, is noted for its faithfulness to Monkey Punch's manga designs. And that mm -hmm. is largely credited to Aoki. Um, Kabashima's style was a little more sort of uh, normal, for lack of a better term. And Aoki kind of, kind of straddled the difference there and sort of brought it all together. And it, you can very much tell. Because I think if you open up any chapter of the Monkey Punch manga and then you look at Mystery of Mamo, it is pretty clearly the best translation of that style two moving images um which i think it had to be a movie to do that because his style is so wacky and yeah. this movie really nails that yeah yeah it, it's it's one of the things i love about the way the movie looks and particularly this has got to be like the best jigen ever looks because jigen yep. is the most monkey punch character design and he looks so fucking good in this movie there's so many shots where you're just looking at him in profile and it's like fucking hell yes this is like the best character design ever I'm glad you picked up on that too because I have a bunch of notes of just all my favorite Jigen shots because yes, it's he has, I think, the best silhouette in anime history and mm -hmm. this movie has the best Jigen shots. So if you're a fan of Daisuke Jigen and his silhouette, you will like this movie. That is very true. Yeah. Um, and finally for the staff, the real only real like big newcomer among the top ranks here is Yuji Ono, who is the composer for part two and everything else in Lupin other than the woman called Fujiko Mine um, we, we will be talking about Yuji Ono a lot in the weeks to come because he is the Lupin musician and this is where we first uh, well he would have started already on part two but Sean this is your introduction to his music for Lupin it's very very good yeah yes, it's it great <laughs> the, the track is great you know I do I miss some of the bluesy vibes of the part one soundtrack but they're you know it's it's incredibly good music and, and jazz obviously fits uh, Lupin like a glove as well yes. so it's yeah. yeah it's perfect it's great so this movie had a 500 million yen budget at the time, which uh, but 500 million yen budget, which at the time was probably unprecedented for an animated film, very high. They intentionally bragged about it in the marketing materials because this is a number that was more in line with a studio live action feature. The program also boasted of this movie having a 14-month production, which would be pretty long. Uh, Cagliostro was made on a much shorter time span, although for around the same budget. Uh, it used 62,000 cell sheets, 2,800 cuts, 196 sheets of character designs, 218 colors, and 18,000 photos were collected for reference for the mechanical designs and backgrounds. Uh, and they had a staff that they say in the program rose up to 1,315. I don't know if I believe that number. I'm not sure how they're counting that. That would be a lot of people for an anime production like this at the time. Yeah. But I sure. I feel like, yeah, you'd have like your credits would be like a fucking Ubisoft game or something at that point. Yeah. It's like, that's a lot of people. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite know where they counted that, but that's fine. This movie, the program also boasted of using what they called the anime vision system, and that is animation made for Vista Vision. If you don't know what Vista Vision is, that's an early widescreen system. Um, it's basically the early sort of 
like 16 by 9 widescreen. So what we now think of as the standard flat widescreen, like 185 to 1, that's basically the ratio of vista vision. And the way it worked is that they ran the film through the camera on its side, and thus it has a bigger surface and higher resolution. It's kind of the same way IMAX film is run through the camera and the projector, not as big as that, um, but in that same kind of idea. So it's 35 millimeter, but run through differently, has a higher resolution. This is famously used on a lot of studio pictures, including the searchers by john ford by the late 1970s when this movie is made it's not really used for shooting films anymore vista vision winds up being used mostly for vfx work because the high resolution is able to capture a lot of detail and then will degrade less in mm. optical printing so the star wars movies for instance or something like that mm. all of the stuff in the death star trench run would be shot on vista vision and then kind of you know printed together and then matted down to 235 or whatever so for the mystery of mom an animated film that means they used larger animation cells and bigger backgrounds were able to capture more of the detail have a brighter and sharper picture um, and as good as the blu-ray looks and it does look very good I'm actually curious if this is a scan of that actual negative or if there's an even more sort of like detailed version of a print out there because this sounds like a very cool process I'm not sure how much this ultimately mattered I don't think many anime films used this kind of system but you definitely can tell this is a ludicrously good looking movie and like there's a lot of that there's just even more detail i think in the art that is captured here than you often see yes yeah no it, it you can feel the production budget of this movie at work um because yes, yes it, it feels incredibly extravagant um as a piece of animation and it is if people have the blu-ray and they haven't looked at the teaser trailers that are on that blu-ray they are very funny to watch because it is just all they are there's like two or three of them and it's just footage from the widescreen version of the pilot film so it's not even footage from the actual movie and it's just lupin narrating over it bragging about all those stats we just went through it's just yes. lupin talking about like we had you know this much money and it took it's the movie's gonna be this long and da, 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 da. it's like and and also fujiko is gonna be sexy again it's basically like that's like <laughs> the selling point of the movie is look at how many people made it Look at how long it's going to be. Look at all the money we poured in. And also, you'll have nudity in it. <laughs> and, and, and I'm looping. Go watch my movies, basically, those teasers. And hey, you know, it's all that's very true. Yep. The movie was a big hit. Did about twice its budget in rentals. So definitely did well uh, in Japan at the time. Footage from this movie and Castle of Cagliostro, which, again, was only released a year later. These movies came out almost like back to back in that sense, which is crazy. Um, those two games were, or films were combined in the 1983 video game Cliffhanger, which is an interactive movie kind of like Dragon's Lair where the movie plays and you have to make choices to not die. And that actually, that game did come out around the world and it is the first official distribution of a lot of Lupin and through Cagliostro, Hayao Miyazaki material in different places in the world, including the United States. Uh, so yeah, I have not played Cliffhanger, but that is where, a lot of this footage like a lot of people saw it for the first time yes which is that's one of those great weird little historical yep. footnotes <laughs> i i like to think that there's somebody out there who has who loved cliffhanger as a kid and had no idea what it came from is just waiting for, for someone to finally make a cliffhanger too and has no idea that there's like a thousand <laughs> episodes of anime out there that that person could watch i hope that there's at least one person in the world that that is their life story just someone who is now like old you know, down at the VA drinking every night, dreaming of Cliffhanger 2, and finally one day his nephew is watching Lupin the Third on the TV, and he sheds a single tear, realizing it was there all along. Yes. All right. Final note in my historical notes, because I didn't know where else to put it, but the uh, official program that they gave out at the theater says that Jigen smokes Paul Mall cigarettes, and that he goes through 60 of them a day, and I just love that detail, and I wanted you all to know it too. I think that's where all the the money that Lupin steals just goes to fund Jigen's insane smoking habit. Because <laughs> sixty cigarettes a day—that's a lot of fucking cigarettes, man. That's that, that's you're that's getting pretty expensive. Yeah, I mean, okay, how many cigarettes are in a pack? That's twenty cigarettes in a pack. So he's smoking at least three packs a day. That is, yeah, that's a lot of money. That's a lot. That's not unheard yeah. of. There are people who have done that, but that is a lot. <laughs> You know, it's you like, know. you know, I, I really wish that, you know, Lupin or going on or someone, you know, would maybe, you know, talk to G and it's like, hey, man, you know, you're getting up there in years like you can't keep up this habit. It's like it's really changing you. 
Um, you know, that's that's the we just need the like the special episode of Lupin the Third, the after school special <laughs> where they confront Lupin about his or uh, Jigen about his smoking habit. Um, and it's just like really kind of break it down for the kids about why it's bad. You know, if we assume Jigen has a lifespan similar to his voice actor, Kiyoshi Kobayashi, Kobayashi didn't die until he was 89 years old. I think if you smoked three packs a day for that entire time and you lived that long, you won. So who cares? You're fine. Sure, yes. You you you, you beat fate in that si- uh, situation. That's definitely true. <laughs> I don't know if Kobayashi smoked that like that as well. Probably not, given how good his voice was throughout his life. Um, yeah. Probably not a three-pack-a-day guy. But yes, that is that is our friend Daisuke Jigen, who is great here. Everyone is great here. One thing I love about Mystery of Mamo that I will just say right off the bat, and this is not true about Cagliostro or, frankly, a lot of pieces of Lupin Media, uh, this one does bring the whole gang along for the ride. And I think all five of the characters have great stuff to do here. It's like a very well-balanced uh, film in terms of the cast and that's something I really adore about this movie that you will not you know I think it's hard to do a movie where you're actually building space for everybody because this is a big cast that's kind of complicated and this movie does it very well yeah I, I agree it's one thing that was very fun because I think that's a thing that particularly a TV show episode doesn't have the space to make for all of those characters to be able to shine and obviously, like, Goemon was the main one who always kind of got left in the dust. Like, he only had those two episodes that it felt like really worked for him in the original. Um, so it was fun to just get something where, you know, Goemon's not the biggest character in this movie, but he feels like an important character. And he's got a couple of really killer scenes. Um, and then obviously Jigen has great stuff. Fujiko's in it a lot. Um, then obviously Lupin's the main character. And yeah, it is nice to feel like, You've got the whole gang together. And this is probably for me, you know, with, again, I the only Lupin stuff I've watched is stuff that we've covered so far on the podcast, part one and now this movie. This is the best use of, like, the gang as a full set of cast of anything I've seen so far. Like, I don't think there's anything in part one that nails this. And obviously that's partially because the movie has the time to do it. Um, but it, it is, like, the most I've been convinced by okay, yeah, the Lupin gang. Like, you get all of them together and see how they all bounce off of each other. Like, that really works in this film in a way that I don't think an episode in the part one really nailed that vibe to me. Yeah, and again, it is just a hard thing. Like, I think a lot of the best TV episodes are ones that are going to zoom in on one character. Like, I think you Mm -hmm. think of, like, the great Fujiko episodes or the great Jigen episodes or something like that. And it's pretty rare that you're going to try to do one that is going to accommodate all five equally. This movie is not quite equal because it it, it doesn't have to be. Um, but everybody is here. Zenigata also obviously as one of the five is just... Yes. Zenigata is an absolute delight here. Um, and I just wanted to start with the characters, Sean, because we do have two recasts who will stick around for the rest of this season of Japanimation Station, at least. And that is Fujiko Mine, now voiced by Eiko Masuyama, who did her in the pilot film, but not part one. And we have Makio Inoue at taking over for Goemon. And I feel like the, both of those characters just click immediately with those voices here. Yeah, like, I don't think Goemon is not a huge change to me. Like, I think it's probably overall an improvement, but it's not a particularly different approach, I guess, than Shigeotsuka. Um, but, uh, Eiko Masayama as Fujiko is, like, a very immediate improvement. Like, it's just a much clearer, I think, take on the character, envision for the character. Um, and some of that is also, it's just nice, um, after the second half of part one, where it felt like Fujiko kind of just got diluted as a character, to get Fujiko feeling more like Fujiko again in this movie, but also the voice, um, just fits the character so much more clearly to me. Um, It's just like a much more complete version of that character than I think we got before. Yeah, I think she just like she immediately has the femme fatale voice down Mm -hmm. so perfectly. There is there is an edge that I think is lost in the version of her in part one that is there. You can have like her first big scene with Lupin here where he's got the rose and he's trying to put the moves on her is so fun because I like it's it's Fujiko and Lupin are best when they do flirt with each other but they are also kind of thorny and she will be flirty, but also like punch him or something or like, you know, he will throw something verbally at her and she will throw something back and they kind of have that dynamic. And I think Masayama is, is Yamada's equal in those scenes. Yasuo Yamada Mm -hmm. who plays Lupin and they just have a great chemistry. And then, yeah, with Makio Inoue, part of it is I just, I do know his voice because I've seen other Lupin stuff. I think it's the writing for Goemon. I think it's that uh, he actually finally gets his catchphrase here. I forgot he doesn't say it in part one. 
Uh, and I guess you might not even know this, this is his catchphrase, but his thing, he, the, we get this for the first time in this movie when he cuts the plane in the, uh, in the sewer in that big action sequence. And he says, once again, I have cut a worthless object is how Discotech uh, translates that line. That is like the thing that Goemon is known for saying. Yeah, well, that, um, that's, like, that's like a cliche that predates right. the Goemon character. No, I know, but, but yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, the classic samurai, wandering samurai cut something. Yes. yes, exactly. And I just think there was, it did, I was, I was a little thrown aback that we never got that from Goemon in all 23 episodes of part one, because that is just something that you're very used to. If you've seen any other Lupin media, you're used to him doing that. And there was, there was just something about hearing Goemon finally say that and go, all right, okay, he's here. Our, our, our buddy, our samurai buddy is here and he's ready to play. And that's great. Yes, but yeah, I mean, they use Goemon very well in this movie with his two big scenes where he gets to use his sword, both of them just awesome. Like, this just, yes. it, the Goemon is a character that I think when you have the budget to sort of, like, depict him visually and something like the monkey punch influence here in terms of the style, um, it just sells the way that character looks and the kind of anachronism of the character works so well in this movie because they really just kind of get to relish how, like stupidly cool Goemon gets to be in those yes. moments. I mean, one of my favorite things in this whole movie is Goemon has that big, incredible fight with the guy with the big, like, metal vest, and they're on the rocks, and the waves are crashing. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like the scene that is in the pilot with Goemon, where he's jumping across these rocks, and it's a very cool fight. Um, but his sword gets notched and then breaks because of the metal alloy vest that the dude has, and then Goemon just cuts the dude's face apart, which is an incredible, uh, super Mad Magazine-esque <laughs> image. But then Goemon is deeply depressed because his sword yes. has broken because of his own shortcomings and he basically just leaves the movie um, but Lupin picks up the piece of Zantetsu Ken and then it plays a giant role in the climax that is like low key the best bit of like meat and potatoes plotting uh -huh. in this movie is the Goemon is sad his sword breaks we get a cool scene out of that then Lupin picks up the piece and uses it to burn Mamo alive in one of the most striking images in any piece of Lupin material um, uh, you know, this movie's plot is proudly, intentionally all over the place. That moment is like a surprisingly good piece of like planting and payoff. Yeah, and it, 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 it is that like attention to detail to find ways for it to be connected to the other characters, right? So it's like, it's yeah. one of the ways where even if Goemon is absent for the final act of the movie, other than he's got his one last scene right at the end, um, he, his presence is still felt because you have the tip of Zontetskin there. Um, yes. Yeah, thinking of that scene of, of, of when he fights the guy, do you think that the um, Trunks fighting Frieza, that that is like an intentional callback to this movie of the POV shot that splits along the lines of the wow. dude who's been cut? Because that shot happens here and it immediately gave you flashbacks to Trunks cutting Frieza in half in that episode of Dragon Ball Z. Man, that is definitely possible. I feel like Akira Toriyama is a kind of guy who would like this movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that's totally... I had not thought of that, because obviously <laughs> I saw this movie far after seeing that, so I guess I wasn't even thinking in that order. But I think you might have, you might be onto something here, Sean. Yeah, because I've just... I've, I've never seen that shot be done before, and it is a very specific kind of shot. Let's do yes. a POV shot where a guy has been cut into pieces and have the image like slide and disconfigure along the lines of how they've been cut. That's very, very specific to, to just like stumble on um, your own later. You know, again, this movie is beloved and I think it is like part one, I think in the industry, it is also beloved. This is a lot of animators and people working on this who I think a lot of animators in subsequent generations very much look up to and kind of mm -hmm. venerate. Um, and so it would not surprise me if that was on the mind of people working on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, because it's just, yeah, I mean, the whole movie feels like it's an animator's dream, you know? Yes. It's just the level of detail, the level of care, the level of thoughtfulness that goes into it as just a piece of animation um, is so high. Um, I think it's like why they're bragging about the budget and the number of cuts and all that shit is because this movie, the popularity of Lupin the Third on TV gives this movie the leeway to just be completely insane. And it's one of the things that makes this movie great is like, as with lots of like, I think some of the best art in history, particularly for stuff like film, it often comes from 
people being given way more resources than it probably is what is appropriate for the actual thing they're kind of trying to make, right? That's like how like Citizen Gain is made and shit like that. Is just like in a, in a normal system, this movie would not be made with this level of budget. A movie with like this level of nonsense in it would not get this much um, afforded to it, but it did, and it's fucking incredible for it. Oh gosh, yeah. Is is that where we should start? Just that this is yeah. one of the best looking animated movies of all time. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that. Yes, absolutely. It one hundred percent is. Um, it's why I think people, if you like anime, you have like you owe it to yourself to buy this Blu-ray, um, because it just looks so good. And yeah, there are shots and sequences that are amazing and so striking. Um, one of the ones that jumps out immediately to me from early in the movie is all the stuff around the pyramids at the beginning of this movie. That sequence yes. just looks fucking incredible. Oh my God, the pyramids. It, and and just them driving down the rope and all that shit. It looks so good. It, it looks insane. That one, you also have Zenigata coming with like a, like a real like fucking army of cops behind him. Uh-huh. All of them individually animated. That would be something that would be difficult to pull off today. Let alone, you don't have any like digital tools to help you like add extra people on screen. You are drawing every single one of them. Um, yeah, I think this movie's approach to physics is so much fun. You have that you know motorcycle chase where they go up and out of the pyramid, and then you have Goemon cut the tire so that they don't drive off and die, which is a very fun use of Goemon. And then they're going down the rope. You have, I think. You know, some of my, I talked about this with part one, a lot of my favorite Lupin animation moments is when Zenigata is giving chase and he has such a rubbery, Mm -hmm. crazy body. Uh, And I think you get some of your best moments of Zenigata running after Lupin in this movie. It's incredible. Um, You have the big car chase in Paris that takes you from the streets of Paris to the sewers of Paris out into the mountains. There's a scene where they are driving along a railing that has like gone off over the cliff. Like that scene is basically a fast and furious action sequence done 40 years earlier and roughly 40 times better like it is just unbelievably good um and yeah and then the movie i think gets i don't want to say calms down it it goes into a slightly different mode the first like act is very madcap action then it gets much more there's a lot of surrealism going on in this movie when you get to the island in the caribbean where mamo has his lair it gets like James Bond via Salvador Dali via Mad Magazine is what you get because they're literally like walking through paintings, but he's also meeting historical figures like Napoleon and Hitler uh, who look like Mad Magazine caricatures of themselves. Um, And then the last act gets very sci-fi. It's like James Bond if he was in 2001. All of it is just nuts. And it is such a creative movie. It is such... It has that same kind of celebratory energy as like... I think the finale of part one and Mm -hmm. some other parts throughout that series where it's just like the animators are kind of drunk on the possibility of creation. I think it is one of the reasons why Lupin has attracted the talent it has over the last 50, 60 years is that it's kind of a series you can do whatever you want with. And so as an animator, this has to be kind of a dream project. And for this group of animators, people like Yasuo Otsuka who like drawing their cars and their guns and their watches... Well, boy, howdy, they have 500 million yen to do it, and they're going to they're gonna go to town. And that's this movie. Yeah, and I think one of the things about that is that because the movie has kind of three styles that it moves through, and more or less the three acts, it's got, like, the madcap chase antics of the first act, it's got the, like, mind-bending surrealism of the middle act, and then it's got this weird, you know, like, sci-fi, that's, like, the most James Bondy feeling one to me is the final act where you're going through, like, an underground secret sci-fi base and all that kind of shit. Um, that it keeps the visual language of the movie kind of keeps evolving and stays visually so interesting and arresting throughout. Um, and it is, like, important to note that, that when we talk about how good the movie looks, that it's not just because, like, oh, look at all the frames of animation or whatever, but it's, like, it's the composition and it's the yes. editing and those things as well are so striking. Like, one of my favorite shots is 
the one when at the end of the act one kind of stuff where they're going back to their base after the big chase has happened and it's this close up on the doorknob and Lupin's hand goes to turn the door and opens up the door and then behind it the whole base is completely destroyed and in ruins such a good shot it's so smart and clever how that's like storyboarded and put together to set up your expectations and then the reveal and then the rest of the scene between the characters that happens amongst the destroyed base is so um, kind of juicy with all like the character interactions and stuff and it's a good setting for it to have that dialogue but all throughout the movie it's thinking about how do we kind of like transition and introduce our scenes and keep things visually exciting and interesting with our framing and with our editing um, whether we're having madcap crazy chases through the streets of Paris or we're having you know a conversation with all of our characters in a bar or in their destroyed how to hide out or in a crazy gothic castle in the sky in the Caribbean or whatever the fuck's going on <laughs> um it, it is just there's such a amount of love and care and creativity that goes into how every piece of the movie is constructed together absolutely I I think you're so right it is the composition of scenes it is the storyboarding there is just a dynamism to it that even in like very small moments, like one that caught my eye early on is when Lupin and Jigen are going through the pyramid and there's all the kind of lasers that they have to work their way through. And like just the like dynamic colors that are like lighting that scene and the way their bodies are contorted. It's just, and again, that could be a very simple scene. All it has to show is that they are kind of working through this pyramid to go steal something, but it is such a dynamic visual sequence. Um, one of my favorites in this movie, and it is the best, part of Jigen in his silhouette that you get uh, is when they are on the aircraft carrier in the interrogation room and you mm -hmm. just have Jigen behind the table you know leg up smoking and it is just like every shot in that scene it's like the best police room interrogation scene visually that you will ever watch and this movie is just again it's it's big moments small moments it's everything there's so much love and care put into all of it yes and, and then they really get to stretch their um, creative muscles in that middle stretch where as you identified like they're literally animating lupin doing a chase through classical paintings which when that starts happening you're like it's almost hard to process what you're even looking at because it's sort of a little bit mind bending and then and he's going through like a salvador dolly painting he's literally running through it's like it's not an mc escher like thing it's like he's literally running through an mc escher drawing um and like how all that stuff ties together as well it's just the amount of creativity on display, it's it's a it's why I think it's very appropriate that this movie has the track on it that's just the music or whatever. Because it's like this is a movie that is so visually powerful and so visually interesting throughout that you could entirely watch the movie on mute or just with accompanying music and ignore whatever is happening with the dialogue and the story and the characters and just enjoy it as a visual art piece and it would sustain its entire run because of how interesting it is put together. That middle section you're talking about, uh, the other like reference point I, I didn't mention yet, I would say is it's very clearly Looney Tunes. Like yes. all of the stuff with like Lupin is in that cage and he gets the big guard to come over and he <laughs> walks around. That is the most Bugs Bunny moment you will ever see. Uh, all he needs is some rabbit ears and a carrot and he is Bugs Bunny in that moment. And then running and being chased through the paintings and all of that and like meeting the different historical figures. Like it's, it's very Mad Magazine. It's very Bugs Bunny. It reminds me like... That middle section, honestly, is like surrealist in the way Duck Amuck is surrealist. The like yes. great Looney Tunes cartoon where Daffy is being like everything is being drawn and erased around Daffy. It very much reminds me of that where it is like humorous animation, but with like a craft and a formal uh, experimentation that is really pushing the boundaries of the form. Exactly. Yes. And, and where you're like. You you're, you kind of have to reprogram how you're looking at the image to be able to understand exactly what's going on when they start incorporating the visual, like the classic art paintings um, in and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it definitely that has that like really high level Looney Tunes short kind of quality. Like Duck and Muck is a very good reference point because, yes, I yeah. think that is that is def clearly like an influence. And that's clearly part of the style that they're going for, which has always been some of that Lupin the Third energy has always been very Looney Tunes, right? That's what we talked about last time that Lupin the Third is in that kind of classic cartoon genre of like action comedy hijinks. Um, and what makes it fun is that it is that, but 
or for at least this style of Lupin, it is that, but it's made specifically with an adult audience in mind. So it gets to do things that are more violent or erotic or just get to play with ideas that are maybe stuff that you wouldn't do if you knew that children would be watching. Obviously, there were lots of children watching this. I'm sure there are a lot of Japanese kids that had a very formative experience um, in their <laughs> developmental years watching this movie in the theater. This is definitely one of those movies. Um, yes. You know, like probably like The Matrix was for us where you ended up seeing it probably when you're too young and you learned a lot of things by watching those movies um, that, that you weren't taught other places yet. Um, but yeah, but that, that Looney Tunes energy is so, uh, so potent here um, because it's also like the other place where you really feel it is Zenigata in this movie is just a Looney Tunes <laughs> character and it's yes. the best. He is just sort of elmer fudd like obsessive need to capture lupin which goes like you know he was obsessed with it in the tv show it goes way further here um and he goes so far and is just sort of destroying himself trying to capture lupin for really no reason lupin's not stealing anything he's not committing any crimes like <laughs> there's no reason for zinigata to have to chase him other than it's, it's zinigata's entire reason to exist so it's like is he gonna like attach himself to the bottom of their weird sailboat that they have for whatever reason that they're sailing to the Caribbean island on to just to try to capture Lupin. Yes, he's going to attach himself to the bottom of that sailboat. Um, Because fuck <laughs> it, why not? Honestly, like on that note, Sean, my only complaint with this movie is I learned reading the liner notes on the discotheque Blu-ray that there is an entire alternate opening mm -hmm. that they storyboarded and animated at least in part because some of it is in the trailer. We don't know how yeah. much of it they animated. And when I say animated, like in color, finished, very rare that finished animation gets cut from a movie. But the whole idea was the opening would be at this Buddhist temple. One shot of it does remain because that is where the opening text crawl is over this like Buddhist statue. Um, but the whole thing was that it would open with that same idea of, of Lupin going up the steps to be hung, which is the beginning of this movie. And then you would go to this Buddhist temple where Zenigata is working as like a, a lowly like field worker, like keeping up the temple. And these police, like the police commissioner comes and talks to the priest at the temple saying like, hey, we think this might not have been Lupin. Uh, and so we need to find Zenigata and they go find Zenigata in this hut where he's like got a beard and he's like, you know, chopping firewood and all this. And he just is refusing to accept that Lupin is alive and like his whole like reason for life has been taken away from him. And then finally they get Zenigata to come back into business. And then it would go to the scene that actually opens the finished movie where we go to Dracula's castle. More on that in a second. This is a weird yeah. movie. Um, I so wish that scene was in the movie. That is such a great... And I know they reuse some of it in a film called The Fuma Conspiracy, which we're going to talk about in a future episode um, that Yasuo Otsuka also worked on. And he really wanted to get that scene in there somewhere. Uh, but that would have been such a fun opening. I fucking love that idea. Yeah, I think it probably is for the best for the finished film in terms of pacing that the opening is not that long. Um, yeah. Even though I... I if that scene did it does exist in like a more fully animated form like you say but there's at least the bare minimum there is the shot of Zenigata running out of the hut with a beard on that you can see in the trailer which is in the blu-ray so if you want to see that shot it's it's there in the blu-ray um probably i have to imagine there's probably a little bit at least a little bit more of that animated even if the whole thing hadn't been animated um, that I would love to be able to see that sequence, but this is a, the movie is already like uh, an hour and 40 minutes and it does have a pretty hard swerve that I suspect for a lot of people is probably hard to buy in moving into that third act, you know, like the <laughs> end of them getting out of the castle is so climactic feeling that I imagine I know that like I looked up some like reviews and stuff of the movie and I know that the, some viewers have a hard time making the shift because that is definitely an anti-climax or it's a false climax where you think the movie is ending earlier than it actually is and then they're like no the point is that there's something else that needs to happen here to actually get to the end of the story um and i really like that but i definitely see why it is hard for people i think it'd be super hard to buy if you had an additional five or so minutes at the beginning of the movie setting up the rest of that um so it probably is the right choice and i love the in insanity of the way this movie opens with like no context at all yes. um but it would be incredibly fun to see that scene because it is such a good idea for a scene, even if I think for the sake of the pacing of the movie, it probably needed to be cut. I think you are probably right 
but I am also a Zenigata super fan, and I just love the idea. Uh, but as a Zenigata super fan, this movie services me plenty. The last, I guess, note I want to make before maybe we dive into more specifics is just, you know, we were talking about, Sean, all the different parts of this movie, and that it has so much variety, and that, like, each act is pretty distinct, and there's so many things going on here. And I think one thing that this movie, like, is a real testament to is that, you know, I think a, a tour theory in general in film is overused. And I think it is especially overused when applied to animation, because I think Lupin in general, in this movie in specific, is a good reminder of, like, you know, a lot of the best animation is not done by a, like, single individual genius. Like, mm -hmm. Hayao Miyazaki is a real massive outlier who I think, like, really, like, twists a lot of discussion around the world of, like, animation auteurism, because there are not that many people who do, like write storyboard direct and like draw on half of the cells in their movies and are that obsessive right like that's just a very very rare thing um it is more often you get these kind of cool team efforts where you have a lot of talented people with the different obsessions and different like styles and different things that they do well who come together you know that's why our first season that we did last time was ufo table and like there's no one person you identify at ufo table it is like the house mm -hmm. style and it is the team effort and i like this is this is one of those movies that Soji Yoshikawa's name is director, and he certainly had a big influence over it. But you would never look at this and say, this is the Soji Yoshikawa film. You would say, this is the Soji Yoshikawa and Yasuo Otsuka and, you know, Aoki and all these people together making something crazy. And that is, like, the spirit of it that I love. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, I think this movie is, like, a really good reminder of that because... Lupin as a franchise just kind of feels to me like it is a very animator driven like franchise because so much of it is like so much about like the crazy antics and the action. It's so much more about that than it is about the story. The story can still be good. And I think that there's a lot of actually like really compelling, interesting stuff that this movie does with the story and what it says about Lupin as a character. But it is but Lupin as a franchise and as a character is about the crazy the chase and it's about that and it's about the style and how cool everything looks and is. And that's such a thing that is driven by the animator in the animator's eye in the animator's hand. Um, and so it is like, I think, a particular reminder when you're looking at Lupin that these movies are made by a large group of incredibly talented people who are all coming together in like the job of the director. One of the reasons why so many of these projects have at least two people who are credited in different kinds of directorial roles is it's like you, the job of the director is to get all those people who are physically creating the movie by drawing it and congeal that together into one holistic vision that can be tied together into a 100 minute cohesive project. Um, and that's like how, you know, that director role can be is so vital um, is really important but that each little detail of the movie is made physically by all the people who touch it along the way. And this is a good reminder of that. Yeah. And I, you know, I just say it in part also like, you know, I look, I am a basic bitch who loves the castle of Cagliostro. I think it's one of the greatest animated movies ever made. We're going to get there. I think it deserves every inch of its reputation. I do, but I can hold two truths at once. I also think mystery of Mamo is really fucking great. And I think one of the reasons why Mamo and some other pieces of Lupin the Third don't have the same reputation as Cagliostro does, even if they arguably deserve it, is because they don't have one name you can associate with it, right? Like, mm -hmm. part of the reason Cagliostro is big is that it is a Miyazaki, and it is very much a Miyazaki movie when we get there. You will not mistake it for anyone else's movie. Um, but, like, auteur theory means that, okay, then we can put that on the shelf and we can talk a lot about that. And Mamo, you can't, like, pin down as easily in that way of viewing things. And because that is, especially, I feel like, in a lot of Western film scholarship, the way we view things, it leads us to miss cool stuff like this that is, you know, authored in a different fashion, but is not necessarily any less compelling as a finished product. And so, you know, that's just something to point out here as, you know, we have a lot of big names coming through the world of Lupin the Third. Um... And sometimes it's someone who, like, their style is there in all of it. And sometimes it's something like this where it is such a team party going on. And that's what I love. Yeah, 100%. That's a, I'm glad that you mentioned that because it is something that I think is a distinct pleasure of this movie is that it is that element of animation. But, again, given such a amount of budget and time that this sort of project you normally wouldn't think would get. Yeah. Goodbye, 
Thanks for listening to Japanimation Station. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to like and subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and tell your friends. You can support the show directly on Ko-fi at the link in the description, and remember to check out the Weekly Stuff Podcast, our long-running series on movies and video games on all platforms. And now it's time for our listener question of the week. Who's the better Mamo? Time Traveler Kyosuke Mamo from Part 1, or Mamo, the quasi-immortal little blue dude from the Mystery of Mamo? Sound off in the comments or let us know on social media. And now, back to the show. So Sean, let's talk about some of what happens in this movie that is zany and fun and crazy. Starting with, this movie opens with Lupin walking up the fucking gallows, getting hung in silhouette, and then going to Transylvania, where I guess he's just waiting to fuck with Zenigata. It is the most mindfuck opening to like any movie ever, and I love it so much. It's incredible because they also they bring back the Luke of the Third Part One opening title thing of where they type in like this like what for the episodes is a title. Here it's this big message saying basically that it's like that Lupin the Third has been executed and there was no doubt it was the real it was really him. But there was one man who needed to be sure, and that it, and that it's he got it going to Transylvania, and he goes into Castle, Castle Dracula. He goes into like the basement or whatever, and there's a coffin. He opens up the coffin and Lupin. Lupin is there, or Lupin's corpse, and he drives a wooden stake through Lupin's heart, but <laughs> Lupin is then, like, behind him and going, touch on, and he does this whole thing, and they go on their crazy chase, and it is the most fucking insane opening to a movie, um, especially because, again, like, there was going to be a whole five-something minutes additional <laughs> stuff be preceding this that gives a lot more context to all this happening, um, but no, you're just like, yeah, no, oh, he's been executed. Lupin's dead. Uh, Zidigata has to be sure. So he's going to drive a wooden stick through Lupin's dead fucking heart. But Lupin's not actually dead and he escapes. Um, and then it's like an open question for a lot of the movie of where I thought for a long time that they were never going to explain it. I thought that that was just like, here's like a way to just like really grab your attention immediately from the opening of the movie, <laughs> just to get you really invested because Lupin just doesn't really offer an explanation for what happened. He's a little bit cagey about like, yeah, I mean, it was me. I definitely got executed. It's weird, huh? And they just keep on going on crazy adventures. Um, and then it's not till way later in the movie that you realize, oh, shit, this is actually essential. Like, it's like really critical core information to what is actually happening in, in the plot. Um, it's one of the ways that this movie is far more tightly plotted than you think it's going to be going in. You think that this is all insane nonsense. That means nothing. It is just there to be fun. But it does all tie together. Like everything in this movie comes back in some way and is important in some way. Um, I mean, other than maybe like the Castle Dracula thing, that doesn't come back up. Uh, that's just that's just there to be fun. Uh, that's just there to have the most insane location possible. Um, whoever had the idea on the team to say, let's have it be fucking Castle Dracula, that person deserved a raise. I just, again, I, I love to death the idea that Lupin... I, I feel like he set this all up for Zenigata. I feel like yes. he put the corpse there and then he just hid and he just hung out at Castle Dracula for a couple of days waiting for Pops to come so he could go... <laughs> Uh, and one thing you get immediately, Sean, with all of that is, I don't know how much you noticed this, but uh, Yasuo Yamada, as great as he is in part one, it's it's not quite all the way to the Lupin voice he has for a lot of the later stuff, which is just a little more sing-song. And you mm -hmm. really get that here because now he's been doing it for another year on TV and all this stuff. And I feel like you get that with the laugh right off the bat. He is having the time of his life uh, just as if that performance could get any better. I feel like it does. It's just it's, it's even more just a celebration of a performance. And I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it just it feels like he's really settled into the character. And um, yeah, and it's just it feels like he's just given really fun stuff to play also. Um, yes. And you get the classic thing of where. <laughs> You know, everybody in a movie production, everybody is given more time than a TV show. And that includes the actors. So like the actors also like I think across the board are afforded the opportunity to give like more fully like thought through performances and stuff because they just get to do a lot more with it. Um, and yes, and, and Lupin, it's great in the TV show, equally great, if not even better here. Yeah, no, it's such a masterpiece of a performance, and everyone is on that level. I think, you know, the other two big returning ones we have is Kiyoshi Kobayashi and Goro Naya, and I think both of them are even more kind of confident uh -huh. and, like, having fun with it. 
um, and everybody gets great dialogue and great moments. But yes, one way this movie is very different than part one is we noted part one is very Japan bound. Uh, and part of how you know that is that Zenigata is just working for the Japanese police. So obviously he's not following Lupin all over the world. This movie, I don't think we're ever in Japan at all. We are in, no. we start in Transylvania. We go to Egypt. We go to Paris. We go to that. We're somewhere in a desert in Europe. We're in an I, island. It has the, to be Spain because Spain is yes. the only country in Europe that has anything that's like a desert. Um, right. Although I do, I looked at pictures because it's like, I don't think there's a desert in Europe that looks like it's the fucking Sahara. And the desert in Spain doesn't seem like it looks like that. So I think <laughs> they, they exaggerated the geography a little bit to get your like Uncharted 3 yes. desert scene, basically. Indeed. So, okay, we've got Transylvania, Egypt, France, Spain, the Caribbean, and then the end of this movie is in Colombia uh, with cutaways to America and the Soviet Union. This is a true globe-trotting adventure, and there is something about that that, like, immediately, if there's anything missing from part one, I do think it is that, like, globe-trotting quality that is so crucial to a lot of Lupin stuff, and you have it here in spades, and it is so well done. And it's, it's fun for me because, obviously, like, the... Like, in a modern context, the unorthodox way in which I am going through this by actually starting with part one, um, meaning that I have not yet seen true globetrotting Lupin. Like, there are a couple of episodes in Lupin the Third Part One where they go, like, a little bit abroad, but um, nothing that feels like it is globetrotting adventures. And so this, it just, for me, in my order of how I've watched this, this just feels like, oh, yeah, this is the Lupin movie, where because it's the yep. movie, they get to go to all these, like, fancy locations, which is the classic movie thing, you know? That's, like, even if you're making a movie about, like, I don't know, K-On! or, like, Love Live, that's just a show that's about cute girls in high school doing their band thing or whatever. The movie's when they go to fucking America or whatever, or it's when they go to Okinawa or some shit like that, right? The movie is always when the main characters get to go on their crazy tour around the world. Um, and so obviously that is more just Lupin is always supposed to be that. From, from my perspective, that is like the whole aesthetic that the movie has to be is, hey, we finally get to just like have fun and just bounce around to wherever the fuck we want to go. I mean, I do think the movie has that feeling to it. I feel like the staff probably had that thought because it is like aggressive with how fast it is moving through the world, you know? And like they do, they have so much fun making all these locations different. Like that Transylvania sequence is only a couple of minutes. It's some of the best Dracula production design I've ever seen. Like they go to fucking town on Castle Dracula. And then in Egypt, you already talked about, Sean, how just brilliant all the stuff around the pyramids is. And then in Paris... They use all parts of the buffalo there, I feel like. We're yes. doing chases in the mountains. We're doing chases in the streets. We're doing chases in the sewers. Uh, all of that is just wild. And then, of course, the Caribbean island is where they get to just make up their own part of the world that's very weird and surreal. And then we're in South America. Man, it is such a blast to see all the different places here. You, and you forgot one really key location we do also go at the end of the movie, which is fucking space. Um, <laughs> yes. You also go into fucking space. Um, so this movie definitely, like, a, a lot of mileage is covered over the course of this film. Yes, absolutely. We go into space with a giant building-sized brain because yes. a Lupin can do anything. Yeah. Okay, so we have Transylvania. We have Egypt. That, again, that scene in Egypt where they ride the fucking bike on the rope with Pops chasing behind them. So good, and it's just still the beginning of the movie. Yeah, it's fucking incredible. You also have in here the scene that is Fujiko's um, intro, which has some incredibly good shots. Like, this is where, like, one big advantage of this movie is that Fujiko actually, like, has a good character design, and they're, like, able yes. to animate her well, um, particularly her hair. Like, I think that's one of the things that the TV show struggled with that I don't think registered to me just because I didn't have anything to contrast it with was that like when you have Fujiko with the long hair like you need to have that hair animated more in order to really like sell the whole character design but that's like that's really expensive um and it's you know I wonder if that's one of the reasons why they wanted to do the shorter haircut um is that it makes it a little bit easier to, to deal with um Maybe but there's a here, reason why Miyazaki always gives his girls bob cuts. <laughs> it's it's yeah, just like, like an easy way to, to make it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's the same reason why Toriyama made, invented Super Saiyan. It's like, I just don't want to color in the black hair anymore. Some yep. girls just easier. Just make them all blonde, <laughs> motherfucker. Um, but here it's a movie. You can afford to be like much more interesting with how you're going to animate the hair. You can spend more time on it. Um, in that scene, there's just some like really incredible shots, particularly at the end where she's broken the mirror 
in the shower and she's walking away and the camera pans down and you have her like reflected in the shards of the mirror on the ground. Um, just a lot of really interesting compositions. And of course, like you also have rampant nudity, which can continues throughout the whole film, um, which like, I, I just feel like Lupin needs, I don't know. It feels like this part of like the texture of this franchise to me is you need the inappropriate seventies, like James Bond nudity. It's just, it's just gotta be there. It's something's missing when it's not. Yeah, and I think this movie generally handles it well because I think there's versions of Fujiko gets naked that feel exploitative and gross. And I would say that stuff like in episode one of the first TV yes. series where she's like getting forcibly sort of stripped. Um, I think in this one where it is like she is in the shower or whatever her own space and she is like proudly nude. That is kind of how I often think of like how Fujiko nudity is handled where it is just her body and she doesn't give a fuck. And that is something we frequently see. I think the woman called Fujiko Mine show does this very well. Um, but I think you see that here, you know, there's the, the fucking camera is in there. So she starts breaking everything. And then like a fucking boss, she gets in that sick leather jumpsuit, gets on a pink bike and you get the most lush animation of her riding down the road in in Paris with all the trees along there, that like classic oh, yeah. shot you see in every French movie ever of the road lined with trees, and she's riding down there, and in the sunset, uh, it's very much there's a shot like this in the pilot film that is then kind of adapted for the part one ending, and kind of like every ending sequence to every loop in anime has some image of Fujiko like this, but this is one of the best versions of this. Fujiko rides down the road on her motorcycle scene. It's so gorgeous. Yeah, and it's just, it feels like they set up immediately that um, with, you know, this sort of contrast with, with Fujiko where, you know, she is this central object of desire for both Lupin and Mamo throughout the movie. And she's just kind of like toying with both of them, just wanting to get what she wants. Um, that I think is like, is kind of like the essential Fujiko plot, um, which like gets more of that part one energy where she, it feels like she's playing all sides because she wants what she wants to have. Um, and you're kind of trying to peel back the layers of like, what is that exactly? What are her acts like? How far do her feelings for Lupin actually go? Which I think is remains like a mystery throughout the film is like, how legitimate is that? And how much of that is she's just playing with him? How much it is of it is she's having fun playing with him? Um, like th that kind of stuff, I think just the character feels much more interesting here than she did um, for most of that second half of part one, which I, I appreciated. Well, I think it's one way this movie is able to balance the whole cast as well as it does is that there's a little bit of friction with everyone, right? Like mm -hmm. Fujiko is not just a member of the team along for the ride here. She is like an antagonist, but also the love interest, which is like, I think the sweet spot for Fujiko where Lupin is desiring her, but she is also fucking him over. But then also she clearly has something else in mind. There's the whole detail of her like possibly doing this to get eternal life for both her and Lupin so they can just tease each other forever, I, I would assume. Um, but that's not even, we don't ever, we don't ever, I think this is important for Fujiko. You never get her internal monologue. It's, it's yeah. something you should never really know what is in Fujiko's head because Lupin doesn't. And that is kind of, I think, something this movie does well. But then you also have like Jigen and Goemon, you know, break the ties with Lupin at one point because they are so frustrated with his like obsession with Fujiko. Obviously, you have Zenigata chasing. So it's like this is a this is a movie where the whole team is there, but it's not one where they're necessarily like all working in tandem for the same thing, which I think can work on TV in a 22 minute episode for a movie you need a little bit more and this definitely gets that yeah and i think it is like kind of part of the funda fundamental makeup of the gang is that um outside of lupin and jigen like they aren't bound by like really powerful you know feelings of trust or whatever um you know their their, their relationship is much more complicated than that and then even with jigen as you see in this movie he can get fed up with lupin's bullshit as well so yeah it's one of the things that the movie has the space to explore the ways that those wedges get driven between them, but then also show how, like, at the end of the day, everybody is so sort of taken by Lupin in, like, the way, the kind of almost hedonistic way of life that Lupin, Lupin leads that sort of brings everyone back together. It's like his charisma and his, what you call his ikizama in Japanese, like, the, the sort of, like, the way that he looks at the world, I think, is the thing that attracts all of them to him. Um, and that's what ultimately is the glue that brings the gang together. And yeah, it's a thing that 
a story you would not have the time to tell in an episode of TV with a movie you can really like fully play out all the steps you need to make that plot really work. Absolutely. Um, very good. In the Paris part, we talked about the big car chase. We didn't talk about how that scene gets kicked off by a helicopter coming down mm -hmm. and oh violently God. gunning down dozens of innocent people in like the most astonishingly violent scene in this or kind of any other movie. It is just out of the blue, mass murder into car chase. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like something that, like, you just stepped into, like, Gundam F-91 or something at the beginning <laughs> of that movie, of uh, where it's, like, the way it's shot and edited, um, almost like, like The Godfather, or like a gangster movie or something, of where it's cutting to, like, the harsh footage of the guns on the helicopter firing and, like, the really intense sound, and then cutting to the effects of it in, like, really hard cuts between that and seeing the trees getting shot and blown to pieces and people getting shot and like tables getting blown to bits and stuff. Um, yeah. And it goes on for like several minutes. Like you're like sitting there <laughs> just watching the carnage as Lupin and gang, like in slow motion are trying to sort of like duck down and get to safety. Um, yes. It's a very, it's one of the other places where you feel this is not, you know, Kitty Lupin anymore is like people fucking die in this movie and lots of people die. Um, and it's not the it's not violent in the sense that this movie is not incredibly gory, um, but it is violent in the sense that like the violence happens. It is not trying to cancel it out. There's nobody going off the side saying like, oh, it's OK. They're rubber bullets. You know, you're not getting something like that. It's like, <laughs> no, those people who are just like, you know, having a good time outside of the French cafe. Those fuckers just got gunned down by a random military helicopter. Yeah, and that's very much a, a monkey punch touch that is there if you read kind of any part of the manga is that mm -hmm. there will just sometimes be big acts of violence that unfold and because that manga just moves, you just go on to the next thing. And it's like, it's not about it. No one, there isn't a scene where like, you know, Lupin then looks at the bodies and like thinks about his life and like, what have I done and all the, you know, that's not, that's not what this is. We're going to go on and we're going to have a car chase. Uh, and that car chase is brilliant like there are so many stages to it because you have the chase through the streets you have the chase beneath the sewers it's all got this helicopter that is because it's a car chase but it with a helicopter is like one of the vehicles you have goemon doing his big moment of cutting it in half then you get back up on the surface and you have uh zenigata come out so now you've got zenigata and mamo's men chasing lupin you've got one of my favorite lines of dialogue in this whole movie is when zenigata is chasing and he like gets on yes. the megaphone and he says you should be arrested in arsan lupin's whole home country it'll promote friendly relations between japan and france that is one of the best zenigata lines ever yeah and i love jigen just mumbles to himself he's like that's a real weird reason <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. Yep. It's an incredibly funny, yeah, piece of dialogue I that I, I noted that one as well. Yes, and Zenigata and the cops chase them out into the countryside and up into the mountains, and that is where you then get this giant truck that comes out that Zenigata thinks is on their side, but instead just starts running over the cops, and we get more mass carnage where you literally see some of the cops getting flattened like fucking pancakes. And, Zenigata, and the best part is Zenigata never realizes that they're not like the bad guys you know he's yes. he gets like run off the road and as he's falling off of the road he's like see that lupin look at that power and he's yes. just like falling seemingly to his doom i don't think you ever even find out how fuck city got actually survives that uh but no. I, I love that he just the whole time he thinks this giant massive optimus prime truck just like is you know that's like the new french police like method of chasing down criminals is they just have a giant <laughs> giant optimus prime truck um to go run yep. them off the road oh man and so much good stuff happens here because this is where it basically feels like not just feels like a fast and furious action sequence there are specific scenes i'm specifically thinking of there's this big scene with a truck at the beginning of fast and furious four there's one in seven in the mountains that there was the scene that was shot in colorado where like some of these exact beats happen where like the truck like gets way over the side of the cliff and like it's hanging off but then it is able to like get back on uh fast and furious has never done anything quite as crazy as when the railing gets pushed off and then they are driving with one set of wheels on the railing back onto the road but i think they absolutely should do that in fast and furious uh well, i think is... the reason why they have it is that there is absolutely no way you could sell the physics of of that <laughs> like 
I don't know if you know this, Jonathan. Cars are very heavy. Um, no, and, I know. And, and railings are like because there's also like I wanted like how does that railing? And I want to make it clear. I do not think this is a bad thing about the movie. It's a cartoon. Um, but it is when you try to think about like how does the railing stretch in such a way that it is able to go that far out and come back in without it having been broken? I don't know the physics of that. I it, that's a very they're, they've got very elastic railings uh, and steel in France, I guess. All I'm saying is the Fast and Furious movies have done sillier stuff. There's the scene in Fast 9 where Dom uses a vine attached to his car to like swing around from one island to the next. Uh, that okay. is basically just animated. This is kind does, of like does that. His, does his car horn make like a Tarzan yell? No, and it's the worst. You know, oh, it is a missing okay. part of that movie, which is yeah. too bad. Yeah, I should I um, should have made Fast Nine apparently because I would have done that, and it would have been better movie. It's not a very good movie. That is the the best part of that movie, though. Uh, but no, this is such a good car chase, and you are obviously correct. This is something you could best pull off in animation because it is physically impossible. But like, it's the talent of the animators is they just yes. sell it where you don't you don't look at it and go. Well, that's silly. You look at that and your breath is taken away because it is such a bravura piece of action, you know? Yeah, this whole sequence is amazing because I think part of it is like it is constantly like pushing into the absurd. Like there's a shot that I fucking love because I think it's like intentionally meant to be just like ridiculous. Um, is It's when they go into the sewer and then they, you know, they, it's the classic thing of where you're being chased by something, you think you get away, you like breathe like, ah, oh. and then the thing that's chasing you comes back in. But the way the helicopter comes in, there's like no physical way that a helicopter could have possibly entered the scene. It just flies in from the right of the frame. And specifically, it's not animated to be coming in through the tunnel that they came down. It just kind of breaks the walls of reality and flies in. And to make be clear, I don't think that's a mistake. I think it's like intentionally Looney Tunes of like the joke is that the helicopter can just get to them. Um, and it just continues with the scene. Um, that's then where you get the amazing sequence with Goemon, which I love when they do. I just love how that sequence opens where Lupin drives past Goemon. And as he Goemon's just standing in the sewers, it made me think of there's a very iconic cutscene in Yakuza 0 of Kiryu fighting in the sewers that this is a very similar shot. Um, but Lupin drives past Goemon, and as he's going past, he just yells at a Goemon, Woohoo, Goemon, you're so cool! It just keeps on going, and Goemon just stands there and then does this cool samurai thing where he fucking cuts the the uh, blades of the helicopter. That's amazing. And then when they when the fucking truck comes out, this is another thing that when the the giant truck came out, at first in the first shot they had it in, I thought it was a mistake. I thought they had, like, they drew the proportions wrong, which happens in animation, right? Like, oh, in this one shot, for whatever reason, like, this thing looks too big because it was a mistake and they never went back and fixed it. And then, you know, and then you keep on watching the scene, you're like, oh, no, this is consistent. This truck is just fucking gigantic. It is so ridiculously huge. Like the cop cars go up to maybe about one third the height of the tires. It is like four times the size of a normal semi truck. It's so big that it literally is too big to do the thing that it's supposed to be able to do because Lupin's car can very easily just drive under it, and which is what they do. And, and again, but like, I think this is all meant to be so absurd. Like, they just exaggerate everything and just dial it all up to the absolute most ridiculous bullshit. And I love it. I love how insanely gigantic that truck is. It, like, so inappropriately so. Um, it just adds to the, the, again, the very Looney Tunes energy of the whole thing. It's just as, like, pushing into the ridiculous in a way I, I, I love. Yeah, absolutely. It's a It's a delight. And then the movie slows down a little bit because we have this long sequence in the desert of maybe Spain uh, that is, again, just more holy shit animation all over the place. Incredible, like, shades of all of the sunset, you know, all of the scenes at night when they are in their bombed out hideout and all of that stuff. Um, there is a lot of incredible material here. And this is where the gang kind of breaks up for a little bit here where Jigen and Goemon 
just are like, no, we're not putting up with your stupid Fujiko obsession anymore because it has fucked us up very badly at this point. Uh, and you have another fun sequence with Lupin and Fujiko here where uh, they repeat an image that is in the manga. It's in like every theme song. It's all over the place of Lupin trying to jump into bed with Fujiko and jumping out of his underwear as he jumps, only to be foiled at the last second by something Fujiko does, in this case, having drugged him. Uh, and that is a very funny sequence as well. Yes, I, I particularly I like the shot of where, you know, he falls and then there's this good like top down shot of him just splatted on the ground with his ass hanging out. Um, that is very funny. Yes, yes. Um, it, it is. Loop. Again, we're talking about Looney Tunes. It's all this is all the most Looney Tunes shit in the world. Yes. And I think the, you know, Lupin being a lecherous bastard, you know, and he's like literally he's got a fucking axe like to break down the door to get in with Fujiko, which like that would be a horrifying image if you played it wrong. But I think what always matters in those scenes is that Lupin, A, whenever he actually does get the chance, he doesn't do it. You see that earlier in the scene of when mm -hmm. he almost has her pulled in for a kiss, he stops and is like kind of pulls back but then also fujiko always gets the last fucking laugh and it ends with him humiliated on the floor you know ass up just completely as you say kind of like this like you know gag basically of him on the floor uh and i think that's when those moments are fun and not gross which in some cases they can be but that one is fun yeah again i yeah i'm with you i think they 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 dial it in right and it and it works um in a way that I think it is a delicate balance. I mean, part of it is that there's just like a seventies energy to the whole movie that I think makes the, that if, the, if something tried to do this today, I don't think I would be like fully sold on it. Um, but for the time period, it, it fits with the entire like aesthetic and style of the movie in a way that allows me to buy into that gag. And as you say, um, it is a thing that you can see that for Lupin, it's so much more about like the chase than it is about like actually wanting like, the fulfillment of it with Fujiko. Um, I think that's part of the point of this movie is that it's about him chasing these things. It's not about him having the things. Um, and that Fujiko is stringing him along the whole time and is fully aware of what she's doing and what is going to happen and that she's perfectly fine because Lupin is not... He, he wouldn't do anything, and even if he wanted to, he couldn't do anything to her. <laughs> yes, I think that's right. But, you know, like, it, it is very 70s, but also... You know, one of this movie's reference points is James Bond movies. And I think if you look at James Bond movies of the 60s and 70s, uh, he just full on rapes people in those movies. Yes. Like, yeah. and it is, and it is not, he goes in for an unwanted kiss and gets punched in the face comically or a pie thrown in his face. It's like Goldfinger. He meets pussy galore on the plane and he just fucking forces himself on her. And it is incredibly shocking and gross today. It probably was to many people in the 60s as well. But like, you know, it is different when the joke is he's a lecherous cartoon character who's going to get uh, knocked out or punched out or something and like physically humiliated versus, you know, he is just so masculine. He's going to get whoever he wants, which is gross and stupid. Yes. Yeah, I think for me, the thing with like it being the 70s is more that like it makes me OK with them even going for the joke in a way sure, that like yeah. today I, I just don't think anyone should try to go for those jokes because my confidence in someone being able to pull that off in 2023 is very low. But yes, like when you put it in the context of the time, um, there's a lot of stuff going for this exact kind of thing that is, um, as you say, it is going for it in a way where. It is about the fulfillment. It is like this kind of wish fulfillment for the audience of like, what if you were James Bond and you could have, you could basically force yourself on any woman and they would fall in love with you kind of thing. Um, and that is very much not what Lupin is going for here. Right. Yeah. Uh, one other scene from this whole sort of part of the movie I want to mention, because it is one of the most incredible shots in this movie, is, of course, Jigen goes back for Lupin because they're best friends. Uh -huh. He's always going to come back, right? Uh, but as he comes back, the helicopter is already taking away Lupin and Fujiko. And then there is this absolutely mind-breaking shot mm -hmm. of the camera swinging in up and around Jigen as he kneels down and prepares to shoot at the plane with his revolver. It basically looks like a big UFO table 3D shot, but done in the 70s when you none of that technology existed. So it is just the like... It breaks my mind because of the detail for perspective you have to yes. have frame by frame to pull off that shot. Because it's not just the camera 
you know, the quote-unquote camera, there is no camera. It's an invisible camera that they are having to invent frame by frame. Uh, and it's not just that it is coming around a still Jigen. It is Jigen doing this incredibly detailed down-to-one-knee, pulling out his gun, shooting. And Jigen shooting always looks very good. Um, I, that is probably, like, on a technical level, the most impressive shot of the movie to me. I, I 100% agree with you. I, that one stood out to me as well as, like... It's one of those things where it just like the language of the movie changes and like the boundaries of what you think is physically possible for the movie to do has just been like crossed in this way that feels kind of crazy. Like, you know, for in video games, it's like that first time you saw one of like the arc system work modern fighting games that look 2d and then the camera swivels and you realize it's actually in 3d. It's a similar thing where you're like, oh, I didn't realize I didn't. Oh, that's on the table. I didn't think that that was a thing you could do because, yes, the way that everything is perspective perfect as it shifts and rotates around Jigen as he is animating at the same time and the plane is animating, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it is extra notable because Lupin, you know, especially in this era, doesn't generally go for that. It is a very, like, animatic you know, kind of flat version of reality in, in kind of a classical anime style of everything is sort of on that plane. And again, these are all Toei trained animators who were there, you know, from the beginning and like animate, you know, this is a classical era of animation. So when it goes for like, let's just do a fucking movie shot here. It's crazy. And uh, they yeah. just, they just do it and they pull it off, um, which is great. Yeah. You have the whole aircraft carrier scene here where Jigen and Goemon get yes. taken by the U.S. military, which a bunch of great things here, but I am convinced that this whole sequence only exists because Yasuo Otsuka really, really wanted to draw all of the U.S. fighter jets. Mm -hmm. And this is like the most lush animation of U.S. fighter jets you will ever see. Uh, it's insane. It has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. But like, man, if you want to just go through frame by frame and look at some really beautiful drawings of U.S. fighter jets on a big aircraft carrier, it's wild. Yeah, that's very wild, but then you also get the best dialogue in the whole fucking movie, which yes. is Jigen in this scene, him and Goemon with the Americans. Goemon has no idea what's going on, because Goemon is from fucking 500 years ago or some shit, basically. Um, because <laughs> uh, I think the implication is that they're meant to be speaking English, is what it kind of, like, feels like to me, is how the scene is supposed to be kind of read. Um, obviously they're not, all the actors are just speaking Japanese. But then there's, there's, you know, there's some very fun political commentary where... Um, uh, you know, uh, Jigen gets very upset in what he says to this, like, you know, I used to really idolize people like Humphrey Bogart. Um, but it's like, but is this no, like your democracy? Oh, do you have the lines? He says, I have it because this is one of my favorite lines. I've tweeted about this line before. I love it so much. Is this what you call democracy? If so, I got something to tell you. I used to be a fan of Monroe and Humphrey Bogart. And then he throws his cigarette on the ground. But not anymore. That is the sickest burn. That is the sickest fucking burn. You've got a democracy? Well, you know what? I don't even like Humphrey Bogart anymore. Throw my cigarette on the ground. Daisuke Jigen for life. Love this man. Yeah, but the best part of the scene is that at the end, the, that American general dude, as he leaves the room, he, he turns around and says, and you should be grateful for democracy, and slams the door. And it's so funny. It's the hardest I think I laughed at this movie. It was either this or when you see what is uh, actually in Lupin's subconscious. Those are the two best gags of this whole film. Um, but, man, that that kiss off line by the American dude, like, like, you should be grateful for your damn democracy, slams the door behind him. Oh, it's so good. Uh, it's so fucking yes. funny. Yep. No, I love it. And I do love the implication that they're speaking English because I believe Daisuke Jigen is multilingual and I believe Goemon would uh, die before learning one word of English <laughs> because he is Japanese, motherfucker. Yeah, like, I don't even know if Jigen is meant to be Japanese because Jigen is not, to be clear, Jigen is not a surname in Japanese. It's just the word dimension. Um, And I love yeah. that one of the... Like, he punches basically said that he just likes that word. Like, aesthetically, it's just, like, a cool word. And so <laughs> the name for Jigen came from Jigen Daisuke, which means I love dimensions, or I love the word Jigen. <laughs> um, and he just changed the Daisuke into Daisuke because that's a normal given name in Japanese. Um, so, you know, there it you go. It is the the nationality of all the characters in Lupin is very funny to me because Goemon and Zenigata, I think, are very clearly supposed to be Japanese. Yes. Lupin 
is at least partially French because of his grandfather. Uh, Fujiko Mine and Daisuke Jigen have Japanese names, but are not. it's not clear they're supposed to be Japanese. So, yeah, like, I feel like you could do a movie adaptation with, like, a very, like, multi-ethnic cast. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, they all have Japanese names except for Lupin. So it's a funny kind of thing with the, the cast that I do like. Yes. Um, but Jigen, whatever his nationality, he can definitely understand English. Um you know, and he was a fan of Humphrey Bogart, but maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> we uh, we already talked about a lot of the stuff in the on the Caribbean island. But to go back to all of that, one note I want to make is you have this scene where Lupin is running around. He sees Napoleon and there's that great <laughs> shot of Napoleon turning to the camera and looking. And it is such a like creepily realistic caricature yes. of Napoleon. But then he runs into Hitler and in Japanese, he says, like, in English, Heil Hitler. And this made me stop and go, how did the dubs cover this? And I had to know. Oh, so Sean, that's, I didn't I didn't even go back. I, I should have done this. Uh, but yeah. I'm glad that you did this research. How did it go, Jonathan? All right. Going backwards in time uh, from the most recent dub, the Pioneer dub. This is the one with the voice cast people know today, I, I believe, like Tony Oliver as, as Lupin. That is Heil Meinfuhrer is what he says. In the manga UK dub from 1996, he says, Heil Schickelgruber. I don't think that's a real word. Uh, I think he just says nonsense German. Yes, um, that, it makes I sense have, that the UK would be slightly more sensitive to that than America would be. Yeah. Uh, Streamline from 95 also uses Heil Mein Fuhrer. But 1979 Toho, just an American dude yelling, Heil Hitler. So go 1979 dub, I guess. You went for it, and it is the one that is most shocking. <laughs> yep. He, he, if you wanted to see Lupin just say Heil Hitler, it's like there's it, he does the salute and everything. It's right there. Yes, and it is. Again, that is like, I feel like the most Mad Magazine moment yes. in this movie. <laughs> yeah, because it is very much Mad Magazine Hitler is who he runs into. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, love all that. In this, I don't love Hitler. I like the joke, to be clear. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> you know. I just, I just need to get that audio clip and cut out the word don't, and I can just, you know, I can use that phrase uh, where you said Hitler um, and get rid of that word don't, and I can use that however I want. You know, there is, uh, there are, I learned this, Sean, when I was going through trying to figure out what episodes of part two we're going to do next week. There are a shocking number of episodes of Lupin the Third Part Two that are about Lupin and the gang going after Nazi gold. And uh, it is, and it has led to, if you want to know why the numbering is off on Crunchyroll, it's because a lot of those episodes in their original dub for like Toonami were taken out of order and then pushed off later to like the home video releases because they didn't want the Nazi episodes in there. None of them are about, to be clear, Lupin like joining up with the Nazis, but like, they will have, you know, imagery around it. So, yeah, Lupin, he has gone after a lot of Nazi gold in his career. Yeah, you know, maybe that is also why in that one episode of Lupin Third Part One, you shouldn't have translated Manji as swastikas. That, hey, yes. some astral swastikas might show up eventually, and you're going to need to be able to distinguish between the two. This is also the part of the movie where we meet... Mamo himself, we've heard his voice, and I realize we haven't actually talked about this character. So, Sean, what do you think about our big bad, a 10,000-year-old man who looks like a little boy, but an old little boy? It is the weirdest character design, and I kind of fucking love it. Yes, he's like a freaky little Grinch Mozart baby is basically how I would probably best describe him. In particular, like there are any of the close ups on Mamo, his face is weirdly Grinch esque, like from the yes. old Grinch cartoon. It animates a bit like it. Um, it started freaking me out. <laughs> like, why is why is this like weird little Grinch motherfucker here? Um, I think it's a great design. I fucking love Mamo. Um, it's so right because it's the whole point of the character is that he is he wants himself to be otherworldly right he is like positioning himself and declaring him declaring himself to be a god um and so having him be this sort of very like absurd exists like he like he literally looks like he walked out of a different anime movie and i think that's part of the point of the design is he's meant to break the sense of what is possible and what you're expecting to appear 
Um, that's also part of like the way the character is introduced, which is an amazing scene um, where he's playing on the harp or whatever. Yes. Um, and you only see him from behind and Lupin comes up and you almost expect it to be like a little girl or something. I mean, obviously I knew that it was Mama because I've seen the character design on the box art and stuff. But if you didn't have any preconceived notion, the way it's framed is like it's going to be this little girl or something playing this harp um, because it's so delicate. Um, the way he's playing it and then it's nope it is this weird little wrinkly green man mamo um who has this like deep voice uh and and lupin even calls him like old man kid basically is what he calls him um like jichan boya i think is what he says uh which is a very funny phrase um and yeah it's a it's a weird character design but i think it totally works and there's something just creepy and off about him for the whole movie yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's voiced by Ko Nishimura, who is not an anime voice actor. He's not a voice mm -hmm. actor at all. He's a, an actor from this kind of classical, like, late classical period of Japanese cinema. He was he had bit parts in movies like Yojimbo, Sword of Doom, The Burmese Harp, uh, stuff around this period, uh, and then was an actor on some major TV dramas in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and this is one of his only anime voice roles. Um, and I do think there is that... Whenever you get someone who is like not a voice actor come in, I think you get a different quality. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you get that here where there's just something a little like creepy and off. And I think it was a savvy piece of casting because yes. it definitely helps you distinguish this person from everyone else in the movie. And yeah, Mamo is the weirdest villain. He's very fun. I do. I have always in my head, there's something about him. It's because he is small and blue that makes me connect this movie in my head with the first Dragon Ball Z movie where you uh -huh. have Garlic Jr. Because he does, he kind of looks like Garlic Jr. Yeah. And I do kind of like that the first DBZ movie and the first Lupin movie, which are both just named after their respective franchises, have the hero going up against a little blue guy seeking immortality. And, and you know, just to make you feel good about yourself, Jonathan, I had the exact same thought when I saw Mamo. I also thought of the first Dragon Ball Z movie and Garlic Jr. So, yes. Um, we are on a, and, and I, I they, think they anybody both, would. I think anybody yeah. would. You know, and they actually both are successful in their search for immortality to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, Garlic Jr. gets stuck in the dead zone, but he did become immortal. He comes back for a terrible anime arc, you know. Um, I wonder if we'll, we'll get the Mamo arc of Lupin the Third Part 3 or something, where there's just 10 episodes of them just horribly fighting Mamo up in, you know, Kami's palace. And, and where Lupin has to just, like, physically beat Fujiko like Gohan does his mom in the Garlic Jr. Saga. And it just makes you, like, incredibly <laughs> uncomfortable. Forgot about that. Uh, yeah. To be fair, I've forgotten about a lot of things from that arc. Anyway, yes, I love this whole section. I love Mamo's introduction. I love how he's just everywhere all of the time fucking with them wherever they go. He is such a little drama queen, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this is also around the time where you have, I think, one of the most striking scenes in the movie, which is when Lupin is sneaking around um, and he's in this like room and he turns around and sees that the room is full of this is when he figures out that mom is a clone and the room is full of these bottles with yeah. like babies and stuff in it. And it's just the way that that is shot where you up to that point, you've been having fun, wacky Looney Tunes adventures. And then the music goes away and it's just these shots like shot reverse shot of like reactions of Lupin looking around the room and then close ups on these like kind of deformed fetuses and stuff in these bottles. Um, it's a very it's a very powerful moment at that kind of midpoint of the movie to kind of like recenter everything dramatically again and kind of give you this kind of shock back to reality is maybe the wrong word, but like of a more grounded sort of dramatic core that the movie is kind of needs to regain at that point. Well, it's sort of the grotesque underlying all this weird beauty because mm -hmm. you also have like the opposite side of that scene, like what you're cutting to is that moment where there's all the like ancient butterflies that are flying yes. out into the sunset, which is such a gorgeous piece of animation. And, and it's one of the ways um, Mamo is kind of trying to seduce Fujiko to his side is saying like, hey, this butterfly was extinct, but I brought it back. And this is where you start to learn about he has this like whole collection of people that he has collected and cloned over the centuries of his life. Um, very, very crazy plan. Um, but you know, you're going between that and then you're going to Lupin going around and like hitting the security cameras with a hammer, like Bugs Bunny. And yeah. you have the cloning stuff in the basement. It's just all over the place, but like in a very dynamic way. 
Yeah, and then you get the scene where Lupin and Fujiko are flirting, and then they start, once they see that Mama's looking at them, they start, like, very intentionally kind of, like, over-flirting to piss him off, because, you know, Mama's whole thing is he wants Fujiko to become immortal, too, um, so she can be, like, his immortal bride, or, like, later he says, like, we'll become, like, Adam and Eve in this, like, new world, um... And this is where you get all the stuff about Fujiko saying that she wants to be mortal with Lupin. But then you get what might be my favorite sequence in the whole movie, which is Lupin getting hooked into this machine where um, Mamo tells us that it will like reveal who he is, <laughs> the true nature of him as a person. And it's this sequence where you get to see into his subconscious and it's just shots of actual breasts. Um, so it's just like <laughs> boobs and like we're looking like from like photographs play- is what you're saying, yes. not drawn, from like, but photo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. From like uh, Playboy magazines or something with just like flashes of um, Zenigata that pops up on the screen. And that's yes. when I had to pause the movie because I was laughing so hard. I couldn't pay attention to the sequence because the idea that in Lupin's subconscious, it's boobs and it's Zenigata running after him <laughs> is the most perfect vision for who Lupin is as a person ever. And then you do get some other stuff of where you get like like um Fujiko is specifically like drawn in there and mixed in and flashed in there. And then there's an amazing sequence of uh Lupin just eating pop rocks that then if you read the liner notes, apparently Yasuo Yamada would, did like the voiceover for the commercial for these pop rocks in Japan. Um which you don't need that context for the joke just to be funny that in the eye that because I think it applies um, anyways, but it's especially funnier if would you know that it's a whole like kind of meta joke as well. But so you get all that, and that's hilarious. And then Mamo like turns the machine up even more, saying like, "But now we're going to find out like what like really lies underneath, like what really makes the greatest thief in the world tick." And nothing is on the screen anymore. And he says this great line where he's like, "There's nothing there. Like this is either the mind of a fool or of a god." And I think this, to me, is kind of like where the movie starts actually kind of playing its hand of its story, which is so much about, like, who is Lupin as a person and, like, what makes him tick? And, you know, he's contrasted contrasted with Mamo here. And this is where, like, truly Lupin is, this is like the anti-Miyazaki Lupin. He is just a true hedonist, is kind of my read on it in this movie. Like, all he is doing is he's living purely for his own pleasure, which comes from him chasing after Fujiko and being chased by Zenigata. And that's all he wants. And that's all he needs. He doesn't care about immortal life, right? He's offered immortality and he rejects it, like, immediately. He doesn't need it. Um, all he all he wants is that chase and to, you know, have that fun. Um, and then I think also the pop rocks are in there, right? It's like he's very corporeal and he's very, like, of his body and wants to enjoy things that way. Um, and that contrasts perfectly with Mama, who wants this immortality, wants these, like, higher things in this, like, kind of higher existence that he's striving for to be a god. And Lupin couldn't give less of a fuck about that kind of stuff. And it's where I think this was the scene where both it is the funniest scene in the movie to me. I laughed so fucking hard when Zenigata pops up on that screen. But it also <laughs> is the smartest scene in the movie. It's, like, it's such a genius piece of writing that I think like kind of the core of what the movie is doing gets kind of revealed there. And then from that point onwards, it's why the movie needs that third act is to fully play out then the conclusion of these two contrasting figures, Lupin and Mamo and their two visions for themselves. One who is trying to, who has escaped his body and is going for some like unhuman higher existence and someone who simply wants to live his human existence in the most pleasurable way possible. And one of those uh, gets to succeed and one of them does not. Um, I think that it's, it's why this movie I think is fucking genius and kind of a masterpiece is that it is able to be both fucking ridiculous. And it also so far to me has the most interesting writing and vision for who Lupin is really as a person. Well, absolutely. And I think it is, you you know, it it does follow through to this kind of serious note at the end where Lupin, uh, the, the climax of the movie is he does get the little time bomb on the rocket. And so when it gets up into space, it goes off and the brain gets ejected out into space and dies. Right. And back on earth, you have Lupin looking up at the sky and he says, and this moment, like it's very sober. It's strikingly sober for the movie. And Yasuo Yamada plays it beautifully where he says, thank me later, Mamo. You get to rest. 
finally. And like Lupin is like a hedonist and an idiot, but he also has like a real insight about himself where like, you know, early on in the, in the scenes we were just talking about, you know, Mamo does offer him eternal youth and Lupin is like confused by it. Like, why would I want that? Like what I love is being chased and chasing. And if I lived forever, neither of those things would mean anything. Right. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't have to say it. I think the audience just gets it. And so, you know, what he does for Mamo, he literally sees it as like an act of mercy of like, that life sounded fucking terrible. Let me put you out of your misery, buddy. And he does it and then goes back to being chased by Zenigata and it's heaven. Um, yeah. It is. Yeah, it is very smart. Yeah. And that line you're talking about, I think it's like even sharper in Japanese because it's much more blunt where he says like, like, thank me because you finally got to die. Like, I think they kind of pretty it up a little bit in the translation. Yeah. But it's like he specifically uses the word like yato shine tandakara, like you finally were able to die, um, and he, you know, I think Yamada delivers it with a bit of an edge because also it's like it's not you just got to die. It's also that I think he's kind of recognizing that he just killed him. Um, but yeah, it, it is the thing that I think this movie just has such a smart vision for that character of Lupin and what makes him tick. That to me ties perfectly into the version you saw in those first eight or nine episodes of the third part one and then also it links up perfectly with what i've read of the manga in like that foreword uh written by monkey punch for the version of the manga i read that lays out kind of his vision for the character and what the series was about like freedom and like loving the world and exploring the world and being totally unfettered by these things and unburdened and that is that is who lupin is as a person he's like that taken to this kind of like nth degree um and it's and this movie i think is just kind of like kind of relishing in that version of the character, even as as sort of um, amoral as it can be and kind of anarchic as it can be, and in a way that I think probably Miyazaki does not like, um, based on what I read of that, like, essay he wrote and stuff that you shared with me. I think, like, Miyazaki has, like, a very kind of ethical way that he looks at a lot of his stories, um, and this is, I don't think this is, like, an ethically right Lupin, but there is something very human about him and very relatable about him, and there's a strange heroism to the sign of honesty with which he lives his life that I think this movie gets to kind of... Um, you know, uh, relish in or kind of like, like hold up as there is some value in seeing the world this way. And there's something useful uh, about having a Lupin out there and having that be a perspective on life that can, that can have some legitimacy to it. Yeah. And I mean, this is, you know, a conversation we're going to continue having this season because it is the fun. I think of this character is the elasticity of him and that you can have, you know, people working in the same room on this project, like part one, right? That just disagree on who the character is, you know? Mm -hmm. And the the essay you're referencing, and, and we'll probably talk about it more in future episodes, but Hayao Miyazaki, when he was done working on Lupin in 1980, wrote this essay called Lupin Was a Creature of His Era, where he writes about how kind of, like, his point of view on what they needed to change to make the character sort of work long term. Um, and it is a very, like, cogent argument for, like, he argues that his problem is that Lupin was apathetic and that this reflected kind of an apathy in society and that he wanted Lupin to be someone who had to like more sort of work for something and, and sort of have a kind of goal in mind. And I think that makes sense. And I think it ties definitely in with his vision of Lupin, particularly when we get to Castle of Cagliostro um, and sort of how he kind of posits the character there. But I think this movie is kind of like the best rejoinder of the other side of that argument of like, well, what is the value of the more quote unquote apathetic Lupin who it like loop, like Miyazaki is correct. He is not out for anything in particular, but like, what is the value of living your life that way where he is kind of empty inside, but in that emptiness enjoys life. Um, and I, I just, I kind of love that both of those can exist in the same franchise. Yeah. And, and for me, it's not a either, or it's kind of a yes. And it's, it's that you can get both of these. And I do think like mystery of Mamo of the Lupin material I've seen is the best articulation of this version of Lupin, the kind of, I guess we would call it the monkey punch Lupin. Um, obviously Lupin is much bigger than just monkey punch at this point, um, you know, with 60 years of anime and a lot of different cooks in the kitchen. Um, but I think for this version, like this is the best articulation of that, no doubt. Yeah. 
because this is then where in the movie, right after this, you have actions that we kind of talked about with like um, Goemon and stuff where the island starts to fall apart. Goemon gets his cool um, Frieza fight and the dude gets his head fucking cut into thirds, which is also an amazing shot where he starts to try to put his head back together, yes. <laughs> um, which is like almost makes it worse that like in this impossible way, he's somehow still conscious, even though his head is in like three different slices. Um but but then this is where you get what is the the kind of false climax of the movie of where you kind of feel oh the movie's done because we shot Mama oh yeah that's another thing Mama got fucking shot in the head by Jigen um which is fucking amazing yes. um you know Mama got shot in the head the island is destroyed um everything's like done and all of our heroes are in like this kind of weird hotel room in like Columbia or something um afterwards. And then that's where Mamo comes back and seems to do the impossible. He gives them this like vision of what he claims is his life that he has lived for thousands of years throughout all of human history, that those were not um, copies, that those were like that. That's the actual people, right? That was actual Hitler. That was actual Lao Tzu, because there's also a uh, scene where Zenigata is getting directions to Lupin from Lao Tzu, which is fucking great. Uh, He's literally like, going around the island with a little Polaroid of Lupin asking Lao Tzu and other historical figures, have you seen this man? Which I, I kind of want the like version of this movie that is like a, a short film just from Zenigata's perspective of all his antics. Because whenever we cut to Zenigata, it's fucking hilarious. The like alternate adventure he is up yes. to is great. Where he has no idea anything of what's going on. Yes. He just wants to go get Lupin. Um, but anyways, that like, you know, for Mamo, he says that all of those are like the actual people and that he has been guiding human history. That's why he is a god, because he's lived for this long. Um, and you know, there's this very kind of psychedelic sequence almost where they're given this vision. Um, then Lupin insists that it was that they were all drugged and things were moved around, and like that's how this happened, that there's like that hole in the wall. Um, and Mamo then, at a very creepy shot, Mamo just appears, like, in the window, and he's just floating there, seemingly, um, and takes uh, Fujiko away, seemingly having brainwashed her. Then Lupin says, you know, if you really are a god, like, do something like a god. Show us, like, you know, divine punishment, a natural disaster, and then earthquake happens. And this, like, kind of starts for me what is, like, that final arc of the movie, that I really find interesting, particularly if you contrast it with the other Mamo episode with the time machine, where the thing is just, oh, he just has a time machine. This is where the movie is really pushing the, is Mamo what he claims to be, or is there something else? And I think, like, another part of Lupin's character that's very essential here is Lupin's, like, insistent skepticism. When everybody else has given up, including Jigen, and, and Jigen just, like, sort of has decided to believe effectively that he doesn't know what Mamo is or how Mamo's doing what he's doing, but he just basically accepts it's outside the realm of human possibility. And Lupin is insistent that, no, there's something going on here, that there's a trick. There's always going to be a trick. And that in the end, I think Lupin is proven right, right? Like, obviously, what is happening here is still insane. There's still a giant brain in a jar. But I do not think that... But Mamo is not someone who's been alive for 5,000 years, who has guided all of human history. Those are not... That's not actual Hitler. That's not actual Lao Tzu. Those are clones. These are like counterfeits. They're reproductions of the art he has made. Everything around Mamo is fake. Everything about him is a trick. Um, but he is insistent upon it. Um, and I think that is another one of the things that like Lupin's hedonism and his like insistence on like the material world and material things and material pleasures, like his faith in that means that there cannot be this like kind of higher superhuman existence um which also has one of my favorite lines where he says to jigen when jigen decides to leave Lupin tells him that like this is a bad fit for you because like this is a bad mission for anyone who has faith basically like something like that or like Shin shinji bukai people ningen like people who like believe shouldn't be on this mission um it's another way of where they start to really dig deeper into lupin's character in that kind of final um arc yeah absolutely and it's just constant great scenes at this point. You're talking about that moment when Jigen is like swearing he's not going anymore. And Lupin is walking away and he comes out into the street and shoots that can by Lupin's mm -hmm. foot. And they have this kind of like standoff. And there's that line, there's this really striking exchange where Lupin says he had his dreams stolen by yes. 
Mamo and I have to go after it. And Jigen thinks he just means Fujiko and is frustrated and walks away. And Lupin just says, like, quietly, you are such a classic, truly unchanging. And then goes hiking off to the enemy base. That is another one of, like, the quiet, sober, really smart pieces of writing in this movie. Yeah, because the when Mamu is digging into like that deepest part of Lupin's unconscious, he called it like, I'm going to see your dreams. And this is a man who has no dreams. That was the, what the line was. Like, he either must have the mind of a fool or the mind of a god. Um, and that, you know, for so that word dream coming up again there, I think is very meaningful, right? That like it is because I don't think it is like it, it is Fujiko, but it's also not Fujiko, right? It's like it is that. Um, it is the pursuit of the things that he wants. And if Fujiko is p possessed by this force or this other person, like he can't have that anymore. Um, and so like that dream, um, that thing, that vision of of boobs and Zenigata, that all goes away if Mamo gets his, his way. Because I think that surface level of his subconscious, that was what Lupin's dream is. Um, and that's what he needs to go protect um, by fighting Mamo. I also think there's like a another way I read it is that like if the world is as Mamo says it is if like because all of like the images Mamo flashes before them in that psychedelic sequence it's stuff like the crucifixion of Christ it's yeah. like the rise of the Soviet Union you see Washington crossing the Delaware like all this stuff if that's the case then the world is this like preordained carefully planned thing what role would Lupin the third have to play mm. in that world you know it's like yeah. this this vision of like an entirely like ordered world where everyone has their place and is kind of like put literally kind of like put on ice like mamo collects them and puts them in this little zoo and that is that is definitely stealing lupin's dream if you think about it yeah that, i like that that reading as well yeah that's good yeah so uh, a couple other quick hits, just going back through some things we missed that I want to talk about here that is amazing. Uh, one, we went through this scene too fast for me to mention this, but when you have that moment when Lupin and Fujiko are on the island, like making out and like grossing out Mamo, Mamo is sitting on a throne beneath a gi the giant Michelangelo mural of yes. God making Adam. That is like the most extra fucking James Bond lair I've ever seen. And I adore that image. Yes, it's yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, the entire wall is that fresco, basically. Um, yes, and it's it's Mamo is not shy about trying to make his image for people, right? Like he's very insistent. Yes. I am a god. Look at how cool I am. Look, I even have like the most famous art in history, and I will just you know decorate my whole uh, base with it. Which he's you know saying this to the people who fucking sewed the Mona Lisa into the sail of their boat. So it's like probably not going to be very good for him. But uh, yeah, yes. Oh man. Okay. Speaking of art, you've also got that moment. I think this is when they're in the hotel. Lupin is reading a comic book and he opens it up and it's that ad of the Justice League. Um, all together. Yes, the, this is of, this is um, one of the times they cut to the Americans on the air carrier. Is one of the Americans oh, okay. that is reading it. Um, right. And it's amazing. Yes, because it is an actual... I paused on that frame and just stared at it forever because uh, it's incredible because it's an actual old ad from superhero comics for Clark Bars um, and it's got all of the Justice League there and they have drawn Lupin in with them with his like arms around Wonder Woman, basically. Yes. Um, they have also reformatted some of the text and stuff um, in order to like make it fit the wide image. Um, and, but it's like the full text of the ad, like you can just pause that image and just read all the ads on there, which if you've never read old superhero comic books, the ads are kind of the best fucking part because they're just incredible, weird historical documents. Um, there's like, cause there are ads for like a Spider-Man kite that are in there and like, and it's just like Spider-Man and it's just like, they have the word Spider-Man. It feels to me like this just has to be some sort of copyright nightmare. I'm not sure how and why this is could be in this movie feels it's kind of weird to me um they have they have had to cut it out of some releases um or like licensors have decided not to risk it i think it falls pretty smoothly under like fair use because lupon is in there and it's a parody and like it's a, a second on screen i can't imagine anyone actually going to the trouble of raising a stink over it but yeah it is just it is that's what's funny is that it is just this is not monkey punch came in and drew batman it is the original dc ad of batman with a really funny lupon drawing like he's got these big fucking buck teeth and he's smiling yes. and it's just so great i want this because i did took a take a picture of this 
this shot and put it in the folder. And I do want to like get a high quality screenshot of this on my fucking wall. It's amazing. Yeah, it's fucking incredible. And then I also love because you then get the shot of the guy reading it and you see that it's like supposed to be a Lupin comic book because it just says yes. like Lupin on the cover or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it says about that. Like there apparently are American comic books printed by DC that have Lupin in it as a character that is the Lupin <laughs> comic book. I don't know how that happens in the world where Lupin is like a real person stealing shit. Um, well, feels Lupin weird, is but... a famous, we know that everyone in the world knows about him. He is very famous. So maybe DC just decided to start, you know, writing their own Lupin comic book to, to capitalize on it. Do you think that Lupin has like signed off? Is like, does he get royalties for every copy of the Lupin comic book that's sold? That's a good question. Like, if there was a famous thief out there in the world and you started publishing a comic about him, would he have standing to sue, or would it be like, well, you're a fucking thief? If you came to the courthouse to sue, you'd get arrested, and even then, like, I'm actually I don't know the law on that. I I don't know the law on many things, but that one definitely stumps me. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting quandary. Um, but regardless, I, I just like, I was completely floored when I saw that ad because I think you're right that it is a thing that like doesn't violate anything, but you would never, ever, ever see that in a movie made today, especially no. from Japan, which is particularly, I think, like wary of that kind of copyright violation sort of stuff. You would never see anybody fucking risk it. You know, you're not going to see hydra nor hair of a Mickey Mouse uh, in an anime or whatever. They're going to they might make fun of it um, and like bleep it out or whatever. But you're not going to just have like, here's fucking Batman. Um, it's it, I just my mind was blown when that ad was on screen. And I did spend about 10 minutes just pausing, pausing the movie and staring yes. at it. It's beautiful. Um, another thing we have to talk about is Zenigata's entire little odyssey he goes on from the island, where, of course, he attaches himself to Jigen's boat to get there. Then when the island is being bombed and he's trying to go away, there's this amazing gag where Zenigata uh -huh. had tied a little rowboat to the Lupin Gang's boat so he could jump in that. And then when they go away, he'll be tied to it. And he jumps in and he's all excited. And then he realizes he jumped in the wrong boat and Lupin's gang just goes away. And then Zenigata... I guess is immortal in this movie because he just gets fucking bombed on everywhere. And we cut to him getting up on shore back on the mainland. And right. I guess he either swam or like walked along the bottom of the water all the way back to shore. That dude has perseverance. And when he arrives, he is met by the police commissioner from part one, the like character we would see him talk to sometimes, who takes him to a Japanese restaurant here in Colombia is where they or are. Or the, the Lest Land, as it says on the sign. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and it's like our first little sign of Japan in the film. And he gets pulled off the case by the chief. Um, he's getting given a special bonus by the prime minister. And there's a real kind of sad pathos to this scene where Zenigata is insisting he's the only one who can catch Lupin. And the commissioner is like, but don't you want to go home to your daughter? And they even, and the liner notes say this is the only time in all of Lupin they ever name check one of Zenigata's children. Uh, and Zenigata's finally is like, no. And he rips up the fucking note from the prime minister. And it's like, I will go after him as a private citizen and runs out leading to my single favorite shot of the movie. I put this image in the folder Sean of him standing like on the cliff there's a big sunset there's the silhouette of the city in the background and he is standing with like his shirt oh, yes. like billowing in the wind and it's all drawn like with this sketchy pencil art uh stunning one of my favorite shots in any movie probably the best any got a shot ever holy crap this whole side of the movie is great yes um and this obviously like if they had kept in that deleted scene from the opening um, like the, that police commissioner character would have been in that scene as well. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that's part of, I think, why that scene existed in the original vision of the movie. But there's something even funnier to me about it kind of coming out of nowhere here. Um, and you just get this brief moment with Zinigata, um, where he's given this out and it's like, no, I, I will not. I will. <laughs> yeah. I think my favorite line is him saying, it's like, I will chase and capture Lupin even as a private citizen. Oh, it's like, I don't know if that's legal. I don't think you can do that. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's wrong. Um, but, you know, Zinni God has got to get his prey one way or the other. Yep. It's it's outstanding. I love it. Um, Zenny God is my man. 
Yeah. And then, of course, we have the finale. We have Lupin climbing through the mountains to go get to, like, Mamo's rocket base, which is also very funny. You have this stupendous animation, and in the background of all of it, you have this, like, mad tattered Zenigata hiking after him. It looks like a comedy version of like the Mission Impossible movies with Tom Cruise, you know, free climbing and everything, yeah. but it's Lupin going to the base. Uh man, all of that is great. Yeah, all the and time then, Lupin Lupin has his uh battle damaged outfit on. I like that. Yep. Like this movie, both him and Zenigata are just completely fucked up at by this point and their clothes are basically in shreds. Speaking of the clothes, by the way, this is our first uh, site in animation. It, it would have happened in part two as well. But for this season of Japanimation Station of Lupin in the Red Jacket, Sean, what do you think of Red Jacket Lupin versus Green Jacket Lupin? Well, you did get Red Jacket Lupin in the pilot film and in That's some of the correct. shots of the opening of Lupin the Third Part One, which was always delightful um, because yeah. this is like very funny to have him in the Red Jacket only in some shots in the opening. Uh, it did take a little bit of adjusting to because I was so used to the Green Jacket. Um, obviously, it looks good. Um, it's it yeah. is obviously what like his original design was meant to be. Um, it was just because red was a hard color for the TV color TVs at the time, like broadcast to do, and it would like come across off. Um, so that's why the reasons why they went with green originally. Um, but yeah, it's good. You know, I think I I like the idea of Lupin having different color jackets, though. You know, I like the yes. idea. It's like it's change it up sometimes. Do you have a preference yet? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's just no. They're okay. they're both fine. You know, it's both <laughs> yeah. good. It's something I do enjoy uh, when we get to Cagliostro, Miyazaki brings back the green jacket for that one. And I do kind of like the idea of kind of maybe characterizing Lupin a little bit by his jacket and playing around with that. But there is something that feels very right about Lupin in red. Uh, I mean, it is the color, like, if you take the broad swath of history he is most associated with, because that's how Monkey Punch drew him in the color pages. And then part two is the longest anime, and various series have, have come back to it. A lot of the specials use the red jacket. Um, but it was fun to see it here after we had all the time. But I do love the green jacket as well. All the all the jackets look good. Yes, I'll say I, I, I did get uh, one of the Blu-rays I bought was the part three Blu-ray. Um, and that's the pink jacket adventures. So I yeah. haven't seen any of those episodes, but I did look at the color or the cover of it and the pink looks good I, I'm, I'm excited for that jacket i am too i'm excited i've never seen any of that show i have that blu-ray as well i'm very excited for that that's gonna be fun uh anyway like and that is honestly the the modern era has put him back in some of the different jackets we need like lupin part seven or whatever one they make next give him a new jacket it's it's time he needs a new color come on guys i want like, the purple let's... jacket adventures i want him in a purple jacket <laughs> let's go come on pimp lupin <laughs> yeah all right. Uh, where were we? Anyway, the stuff with Mama. We mentioned this earlier, the whole thing where he uses Zantetsuken uh, and he like like collects all the lasers and sends them back at Mamo. But that image of Mamo on fire, yeah, walking around the room as this little like sketchbook imp, because they do it with all this like messy raw pencil graphite. But like you look at that and then you look at the flames dancing around him, that animation is something else. And it is so creepy how he's like going towards Fujiko and then finally he dissolves into ash. That is some of the most striking work in this movie and that is saying something. Yeah, it is one of my favorite visual sequences. I mean, one, you just get that incredible shot that it, of all the lasers hitting Mamo in the fucking head. And it's just yes. like, oh my God, like you just really fucked this dude up. And then he gets lit on fire. And part of it is like the colors because there's like four or five different colors to the flames because there's like the blue part in the middle and then you get these different reds and oranges and yellows. And it's just such a kind of like creepy otherworldly look to the flames. And as you say, also has that kind of sketchy graphite look that honestly, like one of the things it reminded me of is if you play like, Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis games and you have like the an enemy gets set on fire and they turn into a different sprite that's sort of that they have to make this kind of generic on fire enemy sprite it kind of reminded me of that there's something about the way that the flames are sort of like wrapped around and sort of like enveloped the whole thing and almost changed the way he looks that reminded me a bit of those designs um but yeah him slowly melting and collapsing to the ground into this little pile of ash very striking um, the very powerful piece of animation, particularly how they use color, is just kind of incredible. Yeah, it's fantastic. We've got that. We've got... Then we see the big brain in the jar uh, that is in the rocket that is going to go off into space because Mamo says there is a civilization out there that has conquered death 
and he's going to go live with them until he comes back to rule Earth. And uh, us with the Dragon Ball Z connections, were you thinking about Dragon Ball Z movie too? Yes, the world's strongest. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I was I was upset that Lupin didn't have to fight a brain in a giant robot uh, suit. Yes. Um, with like big lobster claws. Um, yeah, there's there's some mad Dragon Ball Z energy across this whole thing. You've got the Frieza fights in here. You've got Garlic Jr. in here. You've got Brain in a Jar in here. Um, it's, you know, there just needs to be a huge fucking tree somewhere that has magic fruit. Um, and then it truly would be the old Dragon Ball movie movie. Yep, absolutely. But no, it is, a, it is an even bigger brain than the guy in uh, the World's Strongest film. That is a enormous brain, and Lupin puts the little like device on it that shoots it out when it gets into space. And we get it was funny in my notes, Sean. I started out because there's that sequence where the brain is suspended out in space. There's this incredible image of like all the moisture coming out of the rocket yes. when it blows and like coming out. And then it goes into some abstraction, and I wrote, Oh, there's a little bit of 2001 here with the like brain floating in front of the planet. And then it goes to a direct copy of the shot in 2001 where you have the planets aligning. And I went, oh, there's a lot of 2001 in here. Like, my notes are actually very funny. I'm like, a little bit. Oh, no, no, no. There's a lot. (laughs) But it's so good. I mean, I think it's kind of an ironclad rule. There's a couple of ironclad rules of anime. Like, if something goes on long enough, it eventually has to do the, like, human instrumentality thing about, like, transhumanism and descending, transcending human bodies and stuff like that, which this kind of touches on a little bit. Um, and then also, once an anime reaches a certain level of quality, it has to do 2001 A Space Odyssey reference. It's just, yes. it's how it works. It's how anime is in Japan. Like, I don't make the rules. Um, it's just how it is. It, once it gets good enough, you gotta put the fucking 2001 A Space Odyssey reference in there. Um, it's just how all anime goes. Yep, we've talked about that with Mobile Suit Gundam before. Amaro's entire new type flash when Lala yep. dies is, is the big space tunnel scene. And here we get... Kind of an homage to the beginning of 2001 and a little bit the ending because the brain floating is kind of like the baby at the end. But yeah, that is absolutely crazy. But man alive, Sean, as much as I love all of that, the ending of this movie where Zenigata shows up in the rubble, cuffs their legs together, and then the whole like fucking island just starts getting bombed to shit while they run away is one of my favorite loop on the third scenes of all time. It's it's incredible, but you miss what is the best part of the whole scene. It was long which we're making connections to 2001: A Space Odyssey. 2001: A Space Odyssey has one of the most famous mash cuts in cinema history. Which is oh when oh oh yes, I'm sorry. The chimpanzee <laughs> is using the bone and smashing the bone, and he throws it up, and then it match cuts to the satellite in the future. Well. You know, for a long time, uh, not for a long time, I only did this a couple times as a teacher where we were doing some stuff with movies and I, I talked a little bit about this stuff and used uh, this is like what a match cut is. Um, but now if I'm making a match cut reference, I've got a new example to use. Jonathan, I want you to use this with your classes from now on, which is at the end after he's been hand or not handcuffed, I guess, leg cuffed by Zidigata and then Fujika's there and Fujika's like, Oh, like I'll help you, but only if you're you be serious and give me a kiss. And they start to kiss. And one, it's hilarious that he got like covers his eyes, is like, oh, you don't do anything indecent in front of me, you two. Um, but then as they're fucking kissing, the camera pans down. Lupin pulls uh, Fujiko's top down and presses her nipple, and it match cuts to him pressing her nipple with the American dude pressing the button that launches the nukes, and then it's like five more shots of other people pressing buttons that launch nukes. And it is the silliest fucking thing. I think I maybe have ever <laughs> seen it in a movie, is a match cut of Lupin playfully poking <laughs> Fujiko's nipple with the button launching the fucking <laughs> nuclear bombs. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, it is it, it is fucking amazing. I lost my shit when that happened. I am sorry I almost went over that. Uh, you are correct. It is an incredible match cut. It is so... And it, like... Because we have a, like, slightly more serious run for a couple minutes there before that scene, right? With the 2001 yes. stuff, with Lupin's line about, you know, Mamo, you finally get to die. And I feel like that is our transition back into silliness, is him, yes. is that match cut nipple to the bombs going off. And then it is like, it's like the ending of Doctor Strangelove if you had the characters running through the bombs at the end. It's so yes. silly. And, of course, Fujiko gets away because they come back with the helicopter, uh, well, Jigen, Jigen comes in with yeah an old plane with the rope ladder in uh, Zinigata and Lupin miss it and Fujiko grabs it and so she's in the plane with Jigen 
um, as as she has this great line of her looking at Lupin and Zinigod, and it's like, oh, they're they're such good friends, um, which I love. Yes, no, it's great. And um, well, she has the the final line of the movie is is her looking down and saying, wherever he goes, he'll be chased. That is his destiny, and that's like the way the movie closes. And then you you have this animation of uh, Pops <laughs> Zenigata. I always write it as Pops in my notes because autocorrect will not change it. Um, mm. And Autocrat doesn't like Zenigata, but Pops and Lupin are like they huddle together, like they hold each other's like bodies together, and then they're running with like their middle leg as like you know, yes, yeah, it's just a three legged race, three legged yeah. race, and it's it's you have a shot of them from side view as the bombs are going off everywhere, and then the final shot of the movie is them kind of running towards the camera. That like running animation is some of my favorite silly animation I have ever seen. It, mm-hmm. it will be in the theme song for this season, so if you haven't seen it, go look at the theme song on YouTube and you can see that. Um, because uh, I've put it in there. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Yeah, it's an incredible sequence at the beginning of this movie. Because yeah, because you have like the line with the Fujiko's there. You also have like Goemon is there because he has the the it's it's their destiny. Yatsurando Shikameda. Right, um, he says that. Yeah. Yes. Um. So Goemon has this very dramatic line, and yes, I had forgotten about the three legged race piece, but it is so good. Um. The, the, you know, just seeing Lupin and Zenigata like shoulder to shoulder, arms over each other. Um, having to cooperate at the very end. Um, yeah, it's... This movie is fucking incredible. Like, it is just uh, top to bottom. I think it is, like, based on what I watched from Loop in the Third Part 1, it is, like, the most masterful, pure expression of that insane mix of, like, drama and insane cartoon antics that is the first eight to nine episodes of part one and this is that like pushed to this sort of masterpiece level um for movie animation i would completely agree absolutely um you know and i think it's it's honestly too bad for me that people sometimes want to put these into competition like it's oh we get it all this is great like what a fucking joy it is that two in in a span of two years they made this movie, and then Hayao Miyazaki goes and makes Cagliostro as a one-two punch. That's pretty fucking cool. And yeah. we'll get to the other side of that when we get there. I know you haven't seen it. But, like, I just love that we have both of these because you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I think I think if you're looking for just, like, Lupin as Lupin, as Monkey Punches Lupin, not necessarily sort of Miyazaki's alternate take on it or something like that, this is, a, this is about as good as it gets. Um and we didn't even mention the fucking song in the end credits, the Lupin Ondo, which yes. is the lyrics are written by Monkey Punch, and then an Yuji Ono did the music. Uh, and it's great. It's this very silly song that I love. Um, and it and you have this really fun like uh, video playing alongside it that is sort of a mix of your traditional anime movie thing where they recap the movie visually, but you also have more running animation mm-hmm. of Lupin and Zenigata. So it's just it's incredibly fun. This this did get a I see vinyl single with I think a cover illustration uh, that almost looks like Monkey Punch did it, or maybe one of the animators on the movie. But it's gorgeous. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, this song was uh, was a hit. Yes, no, yeah, that song is also phenomenal. There's something fun about, you know, Lupin, particularly, like, as you saw in this movie, is such, like, an international-feeling character. There's something fun about having this very, like, traditional Inca-style um, song for him uh, at the end, I love. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's the mystery of Mamo. Uh, I, is there anything else you need to say about it, Sean, or have we mostly covered it? Um, uh, one thing I do want to just hit because it was a thing I noted that I thought was very funny and I was looking through the, the screenshots you shared with me and you have one of them uh, here as well, which is the sign um, outside <laughs> of uh, uh, Mama's like base at the end, with the, which is in part of these like, I don't know, like Aztec or Mayan ruins or something. Um, and the sign is amazing because it just says, keep out. Howard Lockwood, they spell Howard with two A's, investigation for ancient remains party. And I cannot for the life of me figure out what the fuck ancient remains party is is meant to mean. Um, it is the most remains party written as one word. I, I so desperately want to know what the fuck, how, how, what did they do to arrive at the phrase remains party? You even missed some of it. It's not investigation. It's investing. Asian. Oh yes, sorry. Investigation. Uh, yeah, I kind of uh, and, uh, <laughs> read read over the actual spelling. And I think Lockwood 
has an extra E in the middle and like a little comma in between. I don't know why, but it is very funny. Uh, it is a great sign. I definitely had to pause the movie and get a photo of that because it's great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, also, I think you do just want to like, because we mentioned it at the beginning, but do want to shout out again. Um, the soundtrack is, uh, oh, this yeah. movie is fucking phenomenal. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, we, we, we talked a lot about how good the soundtrack was with Lupin's third part one. And obviously this is stylistically super different, but you know, I was not worried or whatever about the, the quality of the music with Yuji Ono going forwards, even though I hadn't heard it yet. Like I was sure it would probably be very good. Um, but watching this movie is like fucking tell. Yeah. The soundtrack of this movie is amazing. Well, and we'll talk about it definitely more next week with part two, because this is all, you know, a lot of the tracks on here come from part two or would be okay. go on to be used in part two. Um, and the theme song, Sean, that we get at the beginning, because this movie has kind of a James Bond opening a little bit. Mm -hmm. with It's like opening credits that are like the shots of like cloning happening. Right. Um, and it's very stylish. And the song there, that is Yuji Ono's big loop in the third theme that it is an alternate version of it. The instrumentation is a little different. And there's, I really like he adds at the beginning, there's these like, ooh, ooh, these like big like voices that are coming in, like in the choir. And those are very fun. Um, but it is a pretty straight version of the loop in the third theme. And I love that theme. Uh, we'll talk about it more next time. But that is, that basically is the theme that is still used to this day as the main kind of loop in the third theme song. So yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, I, I didn't know all that part of it, but it is very good. So I'm, yes. I'm looking forward to that sticking around. We'll hear a couple different versions of it next week. So should we tell the kids what we are doing for the next episode, Sean? Yes, because I, I don't even feel like I fully uh, know. What, what, what all are we watching for the next episode, Jonathan? All right. I'm going to go through it here and it'll take a minute because we are tasked with the weird thing of we're going to review Lupin the Third Part 2. But Lupin the Third Part 2 is a show with 155 episodes. It ran for three years. It was a big hit. We are not going to watch or make you watch all 155 of them. From what I gather, like, this is the most popular and, in some circles, beloved Lupin show because, I mean, obviously it was a success. It ran for a very long time. It's got the whole crew together. It's where you had the, you know, classic voice cast all together for the first time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it is a show of the week where it is, you know, variable in quality, right? So I think not necessarily even fans would tell you you have to watch all of it in order. So we are going to pick a selection of episodes. I have highlighted 27 episodes that we're going to do. I had 26, which was a more even number. And then I realized I left off episode one. And I just thought we should do episode one because it's a fun. They kind of acknowledge that some time has been off and it's a fun. It has a fun reference to part one in it as well. Uh, so the episodes that we are going to do. And I'm going to give you the titles also because if you're watching this on Crunchyroll, the numbering is off, sadly. Because one of the episodes got moved later in the dub and Crunchyroll doesn't fix that. So you might want to go online and just make sure you're watching the right episodes. But the 27 that we are doing are episode 1, The Gallant Appearance of Lupin the Third, Episode 12, A Gift for the President. Episode 13, The Great Chase in San Francisco. 20, Cornered Lupin. 21, Goemon's Revenge. 25, Encounter with the Deadly Iron Lizard. I picked that one based on the title. I'm just going to be honest. Yes. Some of these were, I, they, are, I, they are known to be classics. Some of them, I liked the description. 26, A Rose and a Pistol. 27, Where Did the Cinderella Stamp Go? 30, The Wind in Morocco is Hot. 32, Lupin Dies Twice. 34, Lupin Who Turned into a Vampire. Well, we've already been there once, so I'm, I'm curious yep. to see what, how, what, what happens with him being a vampire again. 36. Uncover the secret of Tsukikage Castle. 38. The sweet trap of ICPO. 48. Lupin laughs at the alarm bell. 57. Computer or Lupin. 58. The face of goodbye at the national border. I also just have to say, I like the English title of that one. It's called Gittin' Jigen with it. It's a good title. Uh, so I had a lot of fun with that one. 66, Order, Shoot to Kill. 69, The Woman Pops Fell in Love With, or in English, Zenny Gotta Get You Into My Life. It's pretty good. <laughs> 85, The I... <laughs> you guys can't see it. Sean is breaking down here on the, the video. Zenny Gotta Get You Into My Life is a really good... Bad title. I that is that is fucking amazing. Oh my, that's even better than getting jeeking with it. All right, eighty five. The ICPO's secret plan. Ninety four. Lupin versus Superman. That is another one I picked based on the title. 
97, find Lupin the First's treasure. 99, the scattered magnum. 112, Goemon's close call. 114, the secret of the first supper. 129, in Jigen, I saw the gentleness of a man's soul. 148, the target is, 150, is 555 meters. And 151, the arrest Lupin highway operation. Those are the 27 we're doing. If you're wondering, hey, why are you not doing the really famous Miyazaki episodes? We are. We're going to do those with Cagliostro. Feels thematically appropriate. We'll do those the week after. But those are the 27 we will do for next week. I picked these based on fan recommendations, based on my own knowledge of some of these. And in some cases, apparently Lupin becomes a vampire. And I just want to see that one. And I know Sean wants to see that one. So we're doing it. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I want to see him become a vampire. I want to see Lupin fight Superman. Um, and then I'm especially excited to see what is happening with the encounter with the deadly iron lizard. Station.